No, Mr. Chairman. I, I was under the impression that they were going to answer when we got back. Oh, okay. Are we prepared to answer the, the question Mr. Walden propounded? Could you repeat Walden? the question so we make sure we answer the right question? <laughs> yeah. What's the square you bet. Right? I, will, uh, I will attempt to do that. The, uh, the question was, where are the allocations, uh, excuse me, where, where, are the, the, uh, where, where in the bill are the various industries that were singled out for uh, assistance? Where are those allocations? I understand they're in like Title III and Title IV, perhaps? Yeah, the, the allocations are in. Uh, I, I'm sorry, can you speak? I, it's sorry. hard to hear right here. The allocations are in, the, the primary set of allocations are in Section 782 of the, the Clean Air Act, the section that would add Section 782, and that appears on that appears on page 553. Okay. And there are a number of subsections in Section 782 that allocate allowances to industry, and that, that sets out the specific amounts that go to uh, for all of the different purposes, uh, for all the different programs. Then in particular for industry as well in uh, Title IV. So that's uh, the first one's Title III of the yeah, bill? The first is Title okay. III. Thank you. And it's, it's the new Section 782 to the Clean Air Act. Thank you. But that's why it's, a, it's 782 of the Clean Air Act. And it is, um, it's actually Section 321 of the bill. Okay. But it's Section 782 of the Clean Air Act that has the allocations for all of the uh, industry sources and for others. And then in Title IV. In uh, Title IV, and it is on, uh, starting on page, page 736 in what will be new Section 764 of the Clean Air Act. Uh, that section and uh, uh, one or two sections following that set forth the criteria for how the allocations to uh, energy intensive trade exposed industries would be uh, divided up. And, and is there a, one final question, Mr. is there a definition for energy intensive trade exposed industries? Where would I find that? There, there are specific criteria and you would find that in uh, section 764 eligible industrial sources. 764, okay. And do, do you happen to have a page number? Uh, yes, it's page 736. 736. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank I appreciate you, Mr. your Walden. indulgence. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Chairman, move strike the last word. Mr. Chairman, on this amendment here proposed by Mr. Rogers of Michigan, I'd yield to Mr. Doyle of uh, Pennsylvania for comment. I thank my friend. Uh, just a point of clarification, um, and, and it speaks to what Mr. Walden uh, w was talking about. We didn't, we didn't sit down and just start picking industries out. There was actually a very objective criteria used to decide which industries qualified for this type of assistance. And what we did is measure energy intensity versus uh, trade intensity. To qualify for the program, uh, the industry has to be at least have 5% energy intensity and 15% trade intensity. So if you fell within that metric, then, then you were eligible for assistance under the program. So uh, it was a, a very objective standard, and, and we didn't set out to just, you know, pick, like I didn't get to sit down and say, hey, I want to do the steel industry. Uh, we want, we're looking specifically for high, high you know, energy intensive companies right. with trade uh, pressure. So that's the metric that was used, and that determines which eligible. I think it's my understanding 41 different industries I mentioned three or four of them right. actually qualify uh, under this metric. Would, would the gentlelady yield for me just to, to make one other comment, a uh, question of the gentleman from Pennsylvania, or, or I'm sorry, it's Mr. Stubak has the time, I'm sorry. Sure, I'll I, yield. You, you said there are 40, what, what I'm trying to figure out, because um, I fear I'll get asked this question, am I covered? Am I an industry that's covered uh, if I'm a farmer? Um, clearly, in my part of the world, they use a lot of energy to farm wheat and harvest wheat, um, and they're very trade sensitive. Now, I know ag is sort of exempted from the bill to begin with, but, but you see what I'm saying? So I'm trying to just find out where do I go look 
we, or the defini what that means we, we, in like We'd be happy view. to provide it. We, we actually had a, a, there was actually a nice graph that I, I just don't have it with me here that sort of listed industries and where they fell on the metric uh, in terms, you know, some industries were very energy intensive but didn't meet the 15 percent trade intensity. They, they didn't get to be part of the bill uh, and some vice versa. So, so uh, you know, okay. some met one criteria but not the other. Uh, it was important, you know, when we did the metric, uh, that we have some objective way of saying who gets to be in the program and who sure. doesn't, not just to pick and choose who we wanted in there. So uh, we'll be happy to make sure you have that information. So where, where would I get that information? Um, since we're sort of voting on this amendment very soon here, I know. Do, do you have, does somebody on the staff have that, that, that graph you referenced, that matrix? We'll check and try to get it to you. But, I mean, it's very clear. I mean, it's, it's a very objective standard, I, I 15 and 5. Hard does. Would the gentleman yield? It, Mr. Stupak. I still have two minutes, yes. I was just going to ask under that same thing. Is textiles one of the areas that's covered under this, Mike? Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back my time. The gentleman yields back his time. Are we ready for the question on the, uh, on the pending amendment? Yes, ge gentleman from Louisiana. From Georgia, excuse me. <laughs> we sound alike, Mr. Chairman. I can understand that. Mood to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, and I, I know we're getting getting close to the end on this amendment, but I felt very strongly the need to speak out in favor of this amendment, the, the Rogers Amendment. Uh, I think that it's a, uh, an amendment that we we absolutely should pass now. Uh, I, I realize that uh, there, there are members on the, on the majority side that are very pleased with, with credits or, or, or whatever you want to call it in regard to certain industries and they met certain standards to be able to, uh, to get that kind of treatment and uh, I feel very confident that there was nothing political about any of that. Cases were made and whether we're talking about uh, for oil patch Democrats or, or, or steel industry, aluminum industry, or uh, maybe even the, uh, the, the homeless folks that needed help and, and lie heap. But I think the bottom line, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, is what I said in my opening statement yesterday, and I want to just take one paragraph of that opening statement. This legislation manufactures a cost of business that otherwise does not exist. Let me repeat, does not exist, regardless of any formulas or allocations or credits to shift these additional costs around. Someone in this country, the United States, is going to pay. And ultimately, it will be all of us, because this plan will hurt the entire economy. Uh, and that's the whole purpose of the, I think, the uh, Rogers Amendment in regard to China. We have heard a number of members uh, defend uh, the, the policy uh, cap and trade, uh, what we're doing here with the American Energy and Security Act of 2009, uh, saying that the, the president needs something to take to Copenhagen uh, to show good faith uh, to these other countries and maybe to uh, influence them in such a positive way that they'll want to jump on board and and uh, become part of the band uh, and maybe march right off the cliff with us. Uh, but uh, it wasn't six weeks ago, I don't think, that the president was, uh, uh, took a little trip over to, to the UK uh, and in London met with a group of 20 uh, and asked for a little help. Please, God, a little help uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, particularly Afghanistan. And, and where are our NATO partners, partners and what are they doing and how many troops have they been willing to commit? Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I don't hear any uh, great outcry from, uh, from uh, any of these other countries saying, well, we'll uh, absolutely, you can have another 300, you can have another 500. Oh, by the way, we agree with you that we need to get these uh, men and women in the fight and not just sitting around the perimeter somewhere smoking cigarettes. Uh, they're going to be in the line of fire at the tip of the spear, and we're going to shed some blood just like you are for the greater good. Now, I know these, uh, we, we call these things uh, uh, overseas contingency operations. We don't call them wars. Uh, but this situation that we're talking about with our economy is, is just as critical 
Uh, we're talking about people losing jobs, uh, uh, losing their homes, uh, really, really struggling. Uh, and, and yet, you know, where is the righteous indignation uh, over the fact that uh, uh, we're, we're leading the band and we're not having too many people following us in regard to defending our country when our men and women are shedding most of the blood. Uh, so, I mean, I think we can't have it both ways, and I think it's important for us to understand uh, that we're putting a tremendous burden on our people uh, for the sake of, uh, of, of the world uh, reducing greenhouse gases in China and India. And as Mr. Rogers has pointed out, you know, you're talking about, uh, what, uh, uh, a third of the world's population and and the amount of pollutant and, and the, the, I think over the last 20 years, uh, our carbon footprint uh, probably has in increased about 23 percent. Uh, and the carbon production over the same period of time by India is 440 percent, and that of China is just a little bit behind that, maybe 420 percent. Uh, so I don't think we need to be going this alone any more than we should be going it alone in Afghanistan and Iraq. I would apply the same principles to it. Uh, this uh, idea, uh, Mr. Speaker, of, uh, of getting these credits, I think Mr. Scalise was absolutely right. These, these credits are time limited, and when they run out, whether it's 15, 20, 25 years, uh, my friend from P uh, Pennsylvania may have felt that he really cut a good deal and swapped a good knife for a better one. Uh, but at the end of the day, what's going to happen to those companies? I think Mr. Scalise uh, hit the nail right on the head. They may very well just be making plans to head south, and south is offshore. So this is a good amendment, and I urge my colleagues to support it. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, I, I wanted to recognize Mr. Barrow. Oh. Or, just for a brief uh, comment, uh, let, me, let me recognize Mr. Green, but will you yield a brief to me? Brief comment. Oh, go ahead. I know there was said, but coming from Texas, Louisiana, and Georgians don't sound alike. <laughs> Will the gentleman yield to me since he has the time? Mr. Green? Yeah, thank you. I, I just want to draw the members' attention to the, what this amendment before us provides. It says, the administrator, in consultation with the Department of State, U.S. Trade Representative, annually prepare and certify a report whether China and India have adopted greenhouse gas emission standards at least as strict as ours. And if they haven't, I'm paraphrasing now, uh, then, then the provisions of the Act shall cease to be effective. Now, this Act has a number of parts to it. It has a part uh, to uh, bring about greater efficiency. We'll stop that. It has a provision uh, to deal with uh, renewable fuels. Well, we'd stop that. It has a cap on the total emissions and encouraging greater efficiency, and in doing so, investments in carbon sequestration. We'd stop that. We have money for research and development to other technologies. We'd stop that. We would stop all the things that this bill would have us do to make ourselves more energy and that's a bad. independent and a leader in our own fate in terms of uh, how we're going to meet our energy needs, all of that would be stopped if India or China didn't do as good a job as we're doing. We would stop. Are we going to leave our fate to India and China to drag their feet, maybe intentionally, and then say, well, we're not going to try to find, try to find more ways to be efficient in the use of energy. We're not going to continue to find alternatives. We're not going to look for a way to burn coal in this country with a technology that would stop any damage to the environment. Even though coal is a natural resource, we don't import it. We need the investments in the technology. We need this bill. But we don't want this provision to stop us in our tracks. So I would urge uh, members to uh, vote against this amendment and uh, to, to support the bill, to move forward with the legislation. Uh, uh, who, who yielded? Mr. Green yielded to me. I don't know if others want time. I just wanted to make these additional comments. Uh, I, Mr. Presu Chairman. I presume he yields back the balance of his time. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> and uh, we'll now go to this side if there's further discussion. Yes, sir, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shimkus. Strike the last word. Tell him his recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciated your uh, comments. Um, we, we would stop a lot of things, but the biggest thing we would stop 
would the would be the increased cost that's going to go to um, fossil fuel users around this country, and that that increased cost will have a burden of job dislocation. This bill recognizes the fact that there will be job losses. That's why you have mitigation. I would wish every member would talk on this amendment because this is a jobs bill. This is a jobs amendment. This is a jobs bill for China and a jobs bill for India. So if you want to put up what, what Southern Illinois put up with after the 1990 Clean Air Act with 15,000 mine workers losing their jobs, or the state of Ohio that lost 35,000 coal, coal miner jobs, we are going down that route. I concur with my colleagues. And the, the former chairman of the Energy Subcommittee in the last Congress was at a meeting with a senior Chinese official. He was asked twice by two Democrats in that meeting, will you ever comply to a national cap, international cap and trade regime? His response was no. And he went on to say, the West developed their middle class by the use of fossil fuels, and now it is our turn. The West developed their middle class by the use of fossil fuels, and now it's our turn. Well, they're going to develop their middle class. They're going to de develop their middle class on the job dislocation brought about by this bill. And that, that dislocation is already accepted by this bill as a premise of this bill because there is mitigation here to try to soften that blow. But make no mistake, there will be job losses. So what all this amendment says is, let's go and comply. This is all pain. I've said this in numerous hearings. This bill is all pain for the United States economy and no gain. If India and China do not comply, you're going to have increased carbon dioxide emissions. So you're going to go through all this 900-page bill, set up this whole new bureaucracy, costing thousands of dollars, charging ratepayers more for no environmental benefit. None. It's incredible. It's ludicrous. And not only that is we're going to push job dislocation in a time when this economy can ill afford it. I, I find it incredible that we would make it more difficult for manufacturers and job creation in our economy today by moving this bill. When we started down this route in January this year, and this is just the first, really, of many, many amendments that my friends are going to have to vote against, that they will come back and, and see that will haunt them. Because what you are saying is China and India do not have to comply. We are going to comply, and we're going to make it more difficult for us to manufacture goods to compete in the world market. Go ahead. Have your vote. I'm voting for this amendment. With gentlemen, my, with gentlemen, you I would yield. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have a chart that we've provided to your clerk on percent change in CO2 emissions by country. Are y'all able to put that up on the uh, on the screen? We've provided it. I don't know if you've got it where you can put it up on the screen. I don't know. I don't well, know. I'll submit it for the record, but it, it shows. Without it, objection, the charts it, it, will be It's an EIA uh, chart, Energy in, in, Institute of Energy Research. It shows between 2000 and 2007 that China's emissions have doubled and that um, India's emissions have gone up about 38 uh, percent, Russia's have gone up about uh, 10 percent, and the United States has gone up less than 1 percent. In absolute numbers, the U.S. has gone from 5,860 metric tons 5,902, which is 0.1-tenth of 1 percent, or a total growth rate of 42 tons. China has gone from a little under 3,000 metric tons to over 6,000. China is growing at an annual rate of 17 percent a year, 17 percent. Yeah, there's the chart. And then 
so as, as, as a number of our speakers have pointed out, Mr. Chairman, uh, asking the United States, which has already basically frozen its CO2 emissions, uh, to have to do some of these fairly drastic reductions without even acknowledging uh, the growth rate in China, which is larger in absolute terms than the United States, and the growth rate in India, which is number three and, and will catch up with us probably in the next 10 years, uh, just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And I will submit this off for the record, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Are we ready for the question? Uh, Mr. Boyer. I move to strike the last word. Gentlemen, I recognize you for five minutes. I need to provide uh, a voice to, uh, to Indiana and their concerns with regard to this climate change bill, in particular cap and trade. My good friend uh, Baron Hill, also from Indiana, uh, can voice his opinion. But our, uh, our Governor Mitch Daniels has recently wrote a Wall Street Journal piece that I would ask unanimous consent to be included in the record. Without objection. And uh, he voices his, his great concerns, and it almost is very pertinent to our discussion here today about exempting uh, China and India. So I, I'm pleased that you've incorporated his remarks uh, in the record. With regard to some comments made on steel, Indiana uh, is known for its, its steel uh, industries. And uh, I, like probably other members of the committee, have provided testimony over the years to the International uh, Trade Commission uh, regarding the, uh, the impact of the newly independent states in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, Indonesia, and South America uh, with regard to their excess capacity in steel over the last decade and its impact upon uh, not only the global market of steel, but in particular our domestic production of steel. Uh, I personally believe that the combination of subsidies, protections, cartels, excess capacities uh, created uh, an irresistible incentive, uh, almost an imperative for the producers in these countries to sell their steel abroad at virtually any price, and it damaged uh, our industries here in the United States. Um, I'm pleased that the, uh, our own federal government, um, with regard to comprehensive relief under Section 201 of our trade laws, had to take comprehensive and broad approaches to protect our industry. But let's please understand th that impact upon our steel industry was coming from uh, uh, these these unfair trade practices that were placing our steel industry at disadvantage. So I wanted uh, that to be placed on the record. I do have great concerns with regard to China, in particular now that it has overtaken the United States to become the world's biggest emitter, while India becomes the third biggest emitter uh, in the, uh, by 2015, according to the International Energy Agency and the World Energy Outlook Report. So exempting uh, China and India from uh, any form of binding caps is an equivalent to giving them an emissions-free pass for their economic elites. So when I think of Indiana, and we are a, a 93 to 96 uh, percent dependent upon coal as a source with regard to our energies, and according to how the allocations will be uh, spread in this bill, uh, our state uh, has a tremendous penalty not only to our manufacturing businesses, but also to our consumers. And uh, I am equally concerned that uh, we, are, we are truly picking winners and losers. So when, if you're in a manufacturing area and you uh, are, are dependent upon uh, uh, individuals that make those spare parts, um, the, uh, uh, the emissions requirements, if you add a, a trade requirement on there, uh, Mr. Doyle, uh, even to our uh, refiner, uh, not only our, our foundries, if you're going to say to those foundries out there that, well, you don't meet this particular requirement, we're going to offshore those, those parts. And uh, um, there's going to be a tremendous job loss. And so I suppose that some members of the committee are finding some form of satisfaction that that quote is okay. Um, I'm, I'm deeply concerned. Uh, I'm glad that we're having a discussion with regard to steel because, uh, you know, if we wanted to start our own country somewhere, there are probably ten basic elements that you're going to need in order to be successful. 
not only water, portable water and food, but you need steel. And it's very important to our national security. And uh, to think that somehow that we're going to allow the offshoring of our manufacturing capabilities and to become a service society is uh, tremendously concerning uh, to me. And uh, so I just wanted to add my voice in support uh, of the amendment, and I will yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back the, his time. All those in favor of, of the previous question say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. 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 The previous question is ordered. The ayes have it. You just ended the discussion of the whole bill. A previous question on this amendment. No, no. No, no. Mr. Chairman, you've got the, you've got the bill open for amendment at any point. You have just ended discussion on the entire bill. Uh, no. Yes, you have. I hope you're happy because that's what you've just done. <laughs> for the first time in 50 years, you have cut off debate on a major bill uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, I, before, I know the rules, Mr. Chairman. Well, gentlemen will permit. I've asked for the previous question on the pending amendment. It's not what you said. That is not what you said. I'll ask the clerk to read back what you just said. Well, we don't want the previous question on the bill. Then you better ask unanimous consent to rescind your motion. Well, let me ask unanimous consent that we proceed to the vote on this amendment. I object to that. We still have members that wish to speak on the amendment. What members wish to speak on the pending amendment? You got two right down there. I will speak as well. And we'll have at least one more on this side. Then the chair will recognize the three. Well, first you have to. Without objection, the chair will recognize the three people who are seeking recognition. Well, first you have and to. They will Mr. Chairman, if we're going to go by the rules, we're going to go by the rules. I, but I don't believe the gentleman is correct, but let me ask unanimous consent that any action that has been taken be uh, voided so that we can hear from three more members and then we will proceed to a vote. Well, Without objection, that's the order. The chair recognizes uh, which one? It's Ms. Blackburn from no, well, I was looking at the gentleman next to you, but Mr. Burgess, but let's recognize you next. Didn't you speak on this amendment? No, sir. Okay. The gentlelady is recognized. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do appreciate that and I wanted to say a few things about uh, the amendment in support of, of the amendment, and I, I thank you for the recognition there. Um, I do support this amendment, and I am very concerned about what will happen if we do not pass Mr. Rogers' amendment. Mr. Chairman, I appreciated what you had to say about it would terminate investment, it would terminate all these things if we were to pass this amendment and we found that China and India were not coming into compliance or their emissions uh, were not meeting the standards that were set. Now, the important thing about this is we are shipping jobs out of this country because of what will take place with this cap-and-trade bill. We all are hearing it in Tennessee where we have our auto manufacturers our parts manufacturers, our aftermarket auto parts manufacturers, they are very, very concerned. And when I go in to visit with them at their plants and I ask them how they're doing, many times they talk about how very difficult it is to continue manufacturing in this country because of the impact that we have with environmental regulation. Now, as I have said many times, we are all for clean water, we're all for clean air, we are all for clean energy. We are not for taxing people out of their house and home to get there. We are not for passing bills that are going to cause people to lose their job. Unless we take this amendment and unless we consider what is happening with the chief emitters out there, which are going to be China and India, we are putting ourselves at a disadvantage, a competitive disadvantage. I think it is important that we not have a bill that is punishment, which right now, that's what this piece of legislation appears to be, is punishment for trying to be a manufacturer in this country. And Mr. Chairman, I don't think that you and our good colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to be the party of punishment when it comes to jobs growth and jobs retention in this country. So I would encourage my colleagues 
to support this amendment, I would encourage my colleagues to think long and hard about what we are doing to jobs growth and jobs retention in this country and the burden that we are placing on our employers. With that, I will be happy to yield my time to whomever would seek recognition or seek to claim the, the balance of my time. Anybody? I yield back. Generally yields back. Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Chairman. I, I move to strike the requisite number of words. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. And, Mr. Chairman, for the purpose of, uh, of actually addressing a question to the author of the amendment, and we've been at this so long, I just wanted to be sure that I heard the author correctly when he, when he gave his offering statement to the amendment. Uh, did I hear correctly that you said that the United States has actually reduced its energy intensity over the period of time that Europe has employed its cap and trade regimen to the point where our energy intensity is actually less than that of Europe. Did I understand that correctly? And I'll yield to the gentleman. Uh, that, to the gentleman, that is correct. Under the, uh, the European Union, under cap and trade, they reduced it 16.8 percent. Under the United States, using innovation and private industry was uh, done uh, tw over 20 percent in the and, same time frame. And reclaiming my time, could the gentleman Tell me, uh, because I, I don't know the time frame that the cap and trade regimen was in effect in, in, in Europe. I believe it's since 2003. That's the right number. And I thank the gentleman reclaiming my time. So during the um, last seven years, or I'm sorry, the last six years of the Bush administration, when we were told that nothing has happened in this regard, we actually reduced our energy intensity greater than the European Union, who was under a cap-and-trade regimen. I'll yield to the gentleman. That, that is correct, sir. Well, I think I heard someone else, thank you, reclaiming my time. I think I heard someone else reference the fact that we wanted the President to have something to take to Copenhagen. I would submit the President can take this to Copenhagen and, and be quite satisfied that he's done, uh, uh, that he inherited a, a, a good start from his predecessor. And, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'll yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman has yielded back. Anyone else wish to be recognized on the pending amendment? Are we ready for the vote on the pending amendment? Chairman. Mr. Hall. I'd like to strike the last word. Oh, Mr. Hall would like to strike the last word. <laughs> Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. I thought for a while it's going to be the last word for the whole bill. <laughs> you know, this is a pretty simple amendment. It's just administrator, but he can't do it by himself. The Department of State's got to help. The United States Trade Rep has to pitch in and prepare and certify uh, that, uh, for China and, and India and uh, uh, that the standards be at least as uh, strict as those standards that you're trying to require under this act. But the last part there says standards at least as stringent as those set forth in this act the provision of this act shall cease to be effective. And the only way that this act could cease to be uh, effective is for us to yield to Congress to China's very arrogant statement. And the president's gone all over the world saying that we're not a Christian nation and that we're an arrogant nation. You talk about arrogance, China takes the lead in, in being an arrogant nation when they say that they're going to have to produce for us because we're losing all the jobs because of this bill and other such similar bills that they're going to have to produce for us and sell to us, and as such, we're going to be obligated to, ch to cleanse China's skies. Well, that's outrageous, and uh, our president, uh, I think, ought to be careful about what he says, trying to make the world love him and hate us. Uh, we, we don't, uh, we're not an arrogant nation, and we are a Christian nation, and where we don't uh, just apply to the Christianity, we allow others to observe their own pursuit of their worship, we just don't, we aren't a Christian nation where people run their people in our airplane, fly into our building, murder our people, and do it because their God tells us to. I just think that, uh, that this act could, could not cease to be effective any other way. And I don't see why we don't vote uh, yes on this amendment. I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Uh, just for the clarification of the parliamentary situation, it's good to have Mr. Barton sitting here next to me because he has a great deal more experience as a chairman of this committee than I have had. And he is correct on the parliamentary situation. Uh, if uh, we want to end the debate on a pending amendment, 
there may be a vote to end the debate, but if it's put as ordering the previous question, which I mistakenly thought would get us to a, 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 a end debate on, a, on the pending amendment, uh, that would end debate on all amendments. So I thank uh, Mr. Barton for his, uh, his uh, knowledge on parliamentary procedures and- Learned it from Mr. Dingles. <laughs> <laughs> But we will, not, uh, we will not ask for a vote to end the debate. I think we have ended the debate on the pending amendment, and we will now proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the pending amendment say aye. 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 Opposed say no. 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 Mr. Chairman, I ask for a roll call vote. We will proceed to a roll call vote. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. I'm sorry. Ms. Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak votes no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Ms. Gett. Ms. Gett votes no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps votes no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle no. Ms. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon no. Ms. Joukowsky. Ms. Joukowsky no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen votes no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut, no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton votes no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, Mr. Braley votes no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield votes aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt. Yes. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Mr. Boyer. Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Aye. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden. <clears throat> Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise, aye. Have all members responded to the vote? Okay. Mr. Boucher. Well, you call them. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, no. Yeah, he's 
Okay. Clerk will announce the vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, the ayes were 22, the nays were 36. Ayes 22, nays 36. With, if there's no objection, Mr. Murphy would like to be recorded as voting aye. Voting aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. That would be the ayes are 23, the nays are 36. 23 ayes, 36 noes. The amendment's not agreed to. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Sutton, to offer an amendment. Has this uh, uh, amendment uh, pertained to Title I, and has it, uh, first of all, ha ha has this, does this amendment uh, apply to this title? It does, Mr. Chairman. And let me ask uh, the clerk, has this amendment uh, met the time requirement? It has, Mr. Chairman. Uh, will the clerk uh, report the amendment? Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2454, offered by Ms. Sutton of Ohio, Mr. Inslee of Washington, Mr. Dingle of Michigan, Mr. Stupak of Michigan, and Mr. Braley of, of, of Iowa. Insert after section 127 the following new section. Section 128, Temporary Vehicle Trade-In Program. Okay. Mr. Chairman. The, the, does the, the, the chair recognizes the gentlelady from Mr. Chairman. Ohio? Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. The gentleman reserves his point of order. Would, we, would, he, would you like to make your point of order at this time? I'll reserve it. Okay. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, the uh, gentlelady from Ohio to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment will create a fleet modernization, also known as Cash for Clunkers Temporary Vehicle Trade-In Program. And as I begin my remarks, I want to thank my colleagues on the committee who have joined me as co-sponsors, Representative Ensley, Chairman Emeritus Dingle, Representative Stupak, and Braley. I also want to thank Chairman Waxman and Chairman Markey for working so hard to develop this compromise proposal, and thank Candace, uh, Congresswoman Candace Miller and Congressman Fred Upton for working on this concept. This Cash for Clunkers program will assist consumers to buy or lease new vehicles that are more fuel efficient. This program will help consumers, it will also improve our environment, it will also reduce our dependence on foreign oil, stimulate our economy, and help our domestic auto and related industries. Now over the last few months, auto sales have greatly suffered. As you know, these are not ordinary times and we must always remember that our workers are the ones who are truly suffering. And just last week, a Ford assembly plant in my district in Avon Lake informed employees that between 250 and 300 workers may be laid off as the company further aligns capacity with demand. Now this program has the potential to help change that and alleviate this and further job loss in our very important auto sector upon which so many families in this country depend. And this amendment, this fleet modernization cash for clunkers concept will help increase demand by providing consumers with vouchers toward the purchase of a lease of a, or a lease of a new vehicle. And here are the details. Consumers must trade in a vehicle with a maximum combined city highway fuel economy of 18 miles per gallon or less to be eligible for the program. Eligible consumers will receive a $3,500 voucher toward the lease or purchase of a passenger car with the mileage improvement of at least four miles per gallon. If a consumer purchases or leases a passenger car that achieves at least 10 miles per gallon improvement over the trade-in, they will receive a $4,500 voucher. Light-duty trucks, both small and large, also qualify under this program. Small light-duty trucks must have a base of 18 miles per gallon with a mileage improvement of at least 2 miles per gallon over the trade-in to be eligible for a $3,500 voucher. If the small light duty truck's mileage improvement is at least five miles per gallon over the trade-in vehicle, a consumer will qualify for a $4,500 voucher. Large light duty trucks, those over 6,000 uh, to 8,500 pounds, 
must have a base of 15 miles per gallon with at least a one mile per gallon improvement to be eligible for a $3,500 voucher. If the large light duty truck's mileage improvement is at least two miles per gallon over the trade-in vehicle, a consumer will qualify for a $4,500 voucher. And work trucks also qualify, which will assist small businesses replace older, more polluting work trucks. This amendment will accelerate fuel savings nationwide and boost auto sales. Countries around the world have adopted cash for clunkers plans. Just yesterday, the United Kingdom kicked off their cash for clunkers program. And for the month of March, Germany's program boosted sales by 40%. A 40% increase while new vehicle sales in the U.S. are down by nearly 40%. Last month, vehicle sales in the U.S. fell to below 9 million vehicles from 17.5 million in 2005. Auto sales have not been in such a decline since 1955, and this decline jeopardizes our country's largest manufacturing industry and the millions of related jobs. But by adopting this amendment, we can preserve jobs and protect the environment at the same time. Now, recently, President Obama announced that the General Services Administration will accelerate its purchase of 17,600 new fuel-efficient vehicles with the overall goal of at least a 10 percent increase in fuel efficiency. I applaud his leadership and his decision that only vehicles produced by American auto companies will be part of a GSA program. This program, however, is open to all manufacturers, which is part of the compromise to ensure that this program is not delayed by WTO challenges so that consumers can begin to benefit. But I echo President Obama's comments from his April 30th address and encourage all Americans when considering buying a car to buy one made in the United States. Your neighbors, your friends, and our communities who depend on a tax base ask, I, I need us to do this. This amendment is supported by the United Auto Workers, Ohio's Governor Ted Strickland, the governors of Michigan, Colorado, Delaware, Illinois, Kansas, Kentucky, New Hampshire, Oklahoma, Vermont, West Virginia, and Wisconsin. Ford, GM, and Chrysler support this compromise, and President Obama has asked for Congress to send fleet modernization legislation to his desk. By passing this amendment, we will be one step closer. We will be one step closer to reducing oil consumption in this country and improving emissions. And we will be one step closer to preserving jobs during this recession. I urge members of this committee to join with us in supporting this amendment, and I yield back my time. Great. The gentle, gentle ladies, uh, time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't have a major problem with this amendment. In fact, I have an amendment that's almost identical at the desk. Uh, it has a few minor differences. And I want to engage in a, um, in a colloquy with the, uh, the, uh, the author of the amendment, if she'd be willing to do that. Certainly. Uh, Congresswoman Sutton, I've reviewed your amendment on cash for clunkers, I agree with many of the items contained in your amendment. I have some concerns about the language in the amendment, specifically the proposed new subparagraph 128J7C that requires clunker vehicles that are being traded into a dealer to achieve not more than 18 miles per gallon. In my estimation, this is an arbitrary and unwieldy requirement for the trade-in vehicle. I'm not aware of any study that's pegged this number as the right number. To avoid cumbersome calculations and encourage as many trade-in vehicles as possible, would it be possible for you to modify your amendment to remove the 18-mile-per-gallon standard and replace it with a standard that the clunker car be at least eight years or older? I would think this would be fairer and gets more newer vehicles on the road, which I believe is what your goal is. Under the rules of the House and this committee, I cannot offer an amendment to your amendment. You, all, you, however, can make a unanimous consent request to amend your own amendment. If you're willing to make this change, I believe that we could pass your amendment unanimously. I would yield to you for any response you might wish to make. I thank the gentleman for the question, and I appreciate uh, the sentiment. Um, of course, as I introduced this proposal in its early days, um, I had a provision very comparable to what you suggest. Uh, after uh, a lot of work 
to get this uh, initiative to a place where we're going to pass it and we're going to get the benefits underway. Um, that was not part of what was included in the compromise. And so I think that uh, at this moment, uh, at least we need to deal with what we have before us and, and move ahead and start to uh, provide consumers with this relief, get the jobs uh, shored up, stimulate our economy. And uh, so that, that is how I would respond, although I am sympathetic to the notion. Well, reclaiming my time, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that, that you wouldn't be willing to make that change because I think it would make it much simpler. But I understand if you're not willing to. Um, I, I still think this is a, um, um, an amendment that is worthy of support. I will point out that the, uh, the Barton Amendment that's been worked on with Mr. Upton and Mr. Rogers and others um, is very similar. It's also much simpler to implement. And I guess in the interest of full disclosure, I'd have to admit that I have a clunker car that's eight years older. So, so <laughs> I would have benefited had, had we had, I'm not sure how many miles per gallon my own car gets, but uh, probably not 18. Probably okay. I'm probably okay either way. Anyway, um, I do com I compliment the gentlelady for her amendment. Um, I think the uh, Barton uh, Rogers Upton amendment is preferable, but certainly this is a step in the right direction. Gentlemen's time has expired. Seek recognition. Uh, Mr. Barton, I gather that was your time that you were speaking on? Um, yeah, my time um, so Mr. on Chairman? the Democratic side, anybody? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dingell. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I commend the gentlewoman for her offering of this amendment, which is best titled the Fleet Modernization Amendment. And I congratulate her for her leadership in the matter. Um, the amendment has the support of the Obama administration, the governor of the state of Michigan, the International Union of uh, auto workers, aerospace and agricultural implement workers, the UAW, Chrysler, Ford and General Motors. It is something that has worked in California. It is something that has worked in Germany. It produces sales, but it gets old cars, dirty cars, inefficient cars off the market. It will encourage people to go in and to buy cars at a time when that is very much needed. I express to you my thanks as well as my thanks to Mr. Markey, Mr. Stupak, of course, Representative Sutton, and Representative Inslee for the collaborative and collegial approach that each of you have fostered during the negotiations. It, the, the amendment as now constituted represents a fine, a fine value balance between environmental and economic concerns, something which I believe each and every member of this committee can and should report. Uh, in view of the unprecedented turmoil faced by the domestic automakers and the growing imperative to halt global warming, uh, Representative Sutton's Fleet Modernization Amendment stands out as a very practical and effective mechanism by which to achieve consumer savings, reduce fuel consumption, lower car carbon dioxide and criteria pollutant em emissions, and increase sales from a critical sector in the national economy. I thank you for your courtesy, Mr. Chairman, and I close by strongly urging my colleagues to vote in favor of Representative Sutton's eminently sensible amendment. And with three and 10 seconds left, I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Dingell. Further recognition on the amendment. Mr. Upton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure I'll use my uh, full five minutes. I, I too, want to uh, sign up in support of this amendment. Uh, I would join my colleague, Mr. Barton, and I, th I think we could have made it a, a better bill and, and a simpler bill for consumers to understand, uh, though I understand this is the best that we have, and uh, therefore I'm a strong supporter. Uh, one question I have to the author, it, it's my understanding that EPA has a website, www.fueleconomy.gov, and as I understand it, it is that site that consumers can verify whether their vehicle, no matter how old, meets the 18 mile per hour or per gallon uh, mileage. Is, the, is that correct? That's my understanding as well. So if, if, it, if the combined m mileage is 18 or lower, uh, the car will, will qualify. Uh, That's I, we have had a, a real decline in consumer confidence uh, over the last uh, number of months, which is one of the reasons I'm convinced 
that the auto sales have declined almost by 50 percent. Nearly two dozen countries have put this type of program in. Germany is one, South Korea, uh, even I think Lithuania has put this uh, uh, plan uh, on the books. And rather than seeing the continued decline in auto sales, they have gone up. Uh, this last month for all uh, sales here in the U.S., whether it be a, a transplant like Toyota or whether it be a GM, Chrysler, Ford, their sales actually declined, some of them by as much as 40 percent over the previous year. The countries that have installed this type of program have seen double-digit increases, no longer double-digit declines. And that's why this, this, this amendment, I think, is very important. Uh, and one of the, the, the troubles that we've had, the President uh, announced his support for a provision like this last March. Well, we now have a number of consumers across the country saying, where is it? They've got a clunker, whether it be Mr. Barton's or somebody else's. They've got one. They want to take it in, but they're looking for that tipping point to be able to get that discount on that vehicle from the dealer. And so I might just ask the chairman, Mr. Waxman, if, if we're able to pass this amendment this afternoon, uh, knowing full well that the underlying bill won't likely get to the president for some time, um, is there a possibility that we might spring this amendment separately so that to those consumers that are perhaps waiting to get that best deal on their GM or Chrysler, hopefully they're back, Ford, Toyota, Honda, if they might have some assurance that by the 1st of uh, 15th of June or something like that, we can actually get a bill to the President knowing that he stands in full support of this, this amendment. The gentleman, yield to me. I, Will. Think, I think you make a good case, uh, and I'm going to consider it. On the other hand, this does help move this bill forward because uh, I think it makes the bill even stronger. Uh, but I will certainly uh, be glad to talk to you further about it and, and others as well because I think you uh, have set out uh, uh, some good reasons. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back his time. Any further discussion? Who is seeking recognition? Yes. Mr. Braley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my uncle Lyle Nesserud was a Chevrolet dealer in my hometown of Brooklyn, Iowa for about 60 years. And that dealership no longer exists in large part because of what's happening to our domestic automobile industry. Many rural automobile dealers sell pickup trucks and light duty trucks that are defined in the Act as category one trucks, category two trucks, which includes large vans or large pickup trucks, and work trucks, which are category three trucks. So the reason why I wanted this uh, cash for clunkers bill uh, introduced and why I was proud to be one of the uh, sponsors of this bill is because of what's happened to automobile dealers all over this country. It's had a devastating impact on our communities, a devastating impact on, on our economy, and we need this bill to purchase new fuel-efficient cars and trucks and help boost our economy and save American jobs. That's why on March 17th I was proud, along with Congresswoman Sutton, to introduce similar legislation, the Consumer Assistance to Recycle and Save Cars Act, and I'm pleased that the administration has supported this concept and that we now have some very good compromise language that's going to address the balanced views of the auto industry and environmentalists alike. And Congresswoman Sutton has explained the mechanics of this program, but it's very important to note that this concept that we're talking about, cash for clunkers, fits in per perfectly with the American Clean Energy and Security Act because it will save American jobs boost our economy and decrease our dependence on foreign oil. It also achieves the multiple goals of giving consumers a break to purchase more fuel efficient vehicles while we all benefit from a reduction of greenhouse gases and save American jobs by jump starting the auto industry. And we know this works as Congresswoman Sutton mentioned, Germany in the last month had a 40 percent increase in its sales of vehicles just from a year ago and in February had a 20 percent improvement. This bill will make a difference on our, in our economy. It will save families money and decrease our dependence on foreign oil, and that's why I encourage all of my colleagues to support it. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Braley. Any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Shattuck. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I probably won't take the five minutes either. I just want to ask a couple of questions of the sponsor of the amendment. As she indicated that it would apply only to American-made automobiles. I'm looking for the language that defines American-made, or, or if you could clarify that for me, please. Um, I'd be happy to yield. Thank you. Um, actually, that, that isn't what I said, so you might have misunderstood what okay. I said. Um, this bill is open to cars manufactured um, outside of the U.S. as well. It uh, certainly is a, um, a bill that will allow our domestic auto manufacturers to robustly participate, which was a critical component of making sure that, that this uh, program was going to have the desired effect because shoring up jobs in the domestic auto industry is a, a key component of this bill. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Um, second, uh, on page 18 of the bill, it says that a term, the term qualifying lease means a lease of an automobile for a period of not less than five years. Uh, it's my understanding that many automobile leases are for three and four years. Is there a reason why that was selected, and are you amenable to a change to that, or is there a policy decision behind five years? And I'd be happy to yield again. Thank, I thank the gentleman. Um, again, it is all part of the, the balance of this bill to ensure that we have, um, we, we are open to a participation that allows, obviously, uh, us to be compliant with our obligations under the WTO, but also allows all of our manufacturers uh, to participate ro robustly. And so five years was the, uh, the, the amount of time that those who were actively involved in drafting the bill uh, uh, came up with. So reclaiming my time, so if somebody, some company uh, engages in lots of leases of three years or four years, they apparently weren't involved in those negotiations and you're not open to changing that term? Um, again, I, I can't really say that they weren't involved in the negotiations. There was certainly a discussion about all of these provisions, and this is the consensus compromise that was reached to get this program um, off the ground to make sure that all of those out there, all who participate in, in, in dealers who sell cars of every stripe, uh, can, can participate. So that's what I'm saying to you. We had a lot of, of uh, input from people uh, from from various corners, and um, so I'm sure that Thank they were involved. Thank you very much for claiming my time. So it does not apply to leases of under five years. Uh, my next question is, um, there appears to be no income exclusion, so uh, the amount of income of the individual who brings in the clunker is not a factor. It wouldn't matter if they were a multi-billionaire. Again, while I'm sympathetic to, uh, to that idea and, and certainly have discussed it, there is a limit on the uh, price of the automobile of $45,000. Right. And I that, saw that is intended to deal with the same, uh, the same issue that you're raising. But no limit on the income of the... That is correct. Okay. Uh, my last question goes to, to page 19. It talks about an authorization of appropriations of, I believe, $4 billion. Is that correct? That is correct. Did you... Has there been an estimate or a calculation of the take-up rate at the, or, or at the prices per vehicle of the subsidy? And could you explain to the committee how the figure of $4 billion was derived? Or if council uh, can do that since basic, council... Basically, it, uh, this program is intended to provide for about 1 million cars. Council, do you know how the figure of $4 billion was selected? And is there reason to believe that will cover all the cars? Uh, this the number was picked based on, on consultation with the administration's economists and uh, as, uh, and uh, taking a look at what other programs in other countries had done, and the best estimate we could come up with for the program was approximately over the over the year it would be authorized would be about a million cars that would be taken up with about an average voucher of about four thousand dollars each. Thank you very much, I, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. With the, with the I'd be happy to yield to the gentleman from Texas. I, I'm going to ask a question of the author of the amendment because I, I'm very supportive, but I had, in the Barton uh, amendment, we don't have a requirement that you only participate if you get a five-year lease. You don't have a, if, if somebody purchases a car under this program, they can purchase it with cash, they can pur purchase it for any length of time, and there's no limitation. Why do you have a five-year lease requirement? I don't understand the policy. Yeah, but it, what I'm saying is if you purchase, yeah. there's no requirement. The length of the 
the loan repayment, why do we have a requirement the only ones that qualify if they lease it is for five years? Because but would Jeb and yield on that point? I'd be happy to yield to whoever can answer. When, when we're doing the negotiations on this part, uh, this really puts leases on the same footing as the uh, new car purchasers. The average new car is, you know, financed for a five-year period. So we felt it would be unfair if you allowed someone to receive a $4,500 voucher for about a two- or three-year lease. Uh, they really wouldn't have any investment in it because it would mean the voucher would almost cover the entire cost of the lease. So then the consumer could just turn around and get another clunker. So that's why we made it five, so it's same as the new car. Manufacturers do offer five-year leases. You can get a five-year lease. Right. Uh, so, so we made it even, so it's even footing with a new car. And we're afraid if you did for every two or three years, you got $4,500, you'd have nothing invested. You'd just cover the cost of your lease and, and no, no other investment into it. Well, I don't know how. I mean, I know that this has been negotiated, but I would hope that we could have some ability to change that before this bill goes, if it, if it goes somewhere, because there are a lot of people that lease for three years, and it, in the case of a congressional lease, it has to be for two years if you lease a congressional vehicle. And, and I guarantee you, the, the lease cost per month of a $40,000 vehicle uh, is, is over $1,000 a month. So you're going to have more than $4,500 invested. So well, it's a minor point, but it's... it's yeah, but time has expired. Uh, Just 30 seconds. Yes, gentlemen. You, you can't do it all your office account because you've got to be the registered applicant. Who, who's licensed well, in I'm that? Not, I'm that just saying that... Yeah. I'm not, I don't think any congressman would try to lease a congressional. Well, I just want to make sure. I don't want to do oversight on, yeah. on that. <laughs> <laughs> but people who do want to lease a vehicle for less than five years. Yeah, but you this don't is put a requirement in the, in, in the Sutton Amendment that you have to, if you don't pay cash, you have to have a loan for five years. But if you're turning your car over every two or three years, that's not really clunkers. Plus, the idea is I don't want someone just to get a $4,500 lease so they don't have any financial investment in, in this lease. I mean, we're, we're not doing it just to make sure you have a nice would, updated would the car. Yield, would the gentleman yield? Go ahead. The gentleman's time has expired. I might ask just one additional minute. Uh, beyond what without objection. I just might note that uh, in reading the bill, there is a sunset provision, number one, only only one year, and number two, that uh, an owner is only eligible, eligible to do this one time. So that would prevent... The registered owner. Correct. Only so it could be time. you and your wife. Well, that would be two owners if the car was... Uh, Re how's the car registered? That's yeah, sort of the that's key. how it depends. So one owner, one list right. of the owner, whether right. it's joint ownership or, or what. Correct. Uh, but it also has a, only a one-year a one year sunset, so the sunset's next March. True. So it'll be less than one year. And only one vehicle at a time, so only one vehicle. You can't turn in two clunkers for one new vehicle or one lease. Are we uh, ready for the question? Uh, Mr. Terry, you wanted to speak on this. Oh. Yeah, thank you. I, in regard to the uh, initial discussion by Ranking Member Barton on age versus mileage, uh, I would encourage us to continue this discussion uh, if you look at the EPA's fuel economy website that Mr. Upton mentioned, uh, I've looked at that, and what you find uh, on this website by the EPA is that age of a car uh, is, <laughs> is directly related to the amount of emissions. And I thought that was what this bill was about, was reducing the CO2 emissions. Uh, for example, from memory on this website, you can take a four-year-old four-cylinder like my Camry, and from the 04 version to the 08 or 09 version, you have almost a 60% reduction of emissions. Uh, so basing it on the number or the age of the vehicles uh, actually lowers emissions more than by fuel uh, standards alone. Uh, so I'm wondering if that type of discussion occurred uh, amongst the authors of this discussion 
if they felt that they could actually accomplish more uh, by the age. Uh, and I would yield to Ms. Sutton or any of the other authors. All right, I'll, I'll come back. Mr. Upton, you're uh, from Michigan. I was just wondering why none of the Republican side are co-sponsors. <laughs> you sounded supportive. Uh, why I, weren't you included? I, 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 uh, I you need to ask the, the sponsor. I, I'm a co-sponsor of the bill as was introduced on the floor, and I'm uh, co-sponsor with uh, my colleague Candace Miller on this uh, issue as it was uh, described by Mr. Barton and, and really right. the... Pr I now have two questions us, for you. One is, uh, yeah. you're eating um, up my sure. time. I, I apologize. Um, yes, obviously this, this issue has been discussed and as I said, it was, uh, it was drafted that way when I introduced the CARS Act on the floor. Um, again, this bill is intended to have multiple goals. Uh, the, the, and which can't be sacrificed, certainly. The jobs component is uppermost in my mind and I think in the outcome on this, on this measure. Um, we also do want to achieve environmental integrity as well as helping those consumers when we need it, when they need it the most. And I know that you know as well as I do how much they need it out there. Um, so it really is a matter of uh, uh, some things remained um, and some things did not, but uh, but certainly that was part of and, the, uh, and the robust other question, discussion. Why were none of the Republicans from auto industry uh, area included in your amendment? Um, well, I have to tell you that um, certainly the uh, the Representative Upton, as he made very clear, Representative Upton and uh, Representative Miller and others have been robustly involved in the development of of, of the concept. And so did they turn you down, Mr. Terry? Will you yield to me? Yes. I think all members of this committee will have an opportunity to express their view on this amendment, and I would hope we get, I know we'll get Republican if as well as Democratic. I'm reclaiming I my time. Your um, time. I'm just, I would welcome unfortunately, I, I just really feel that this committee has lost any of its abilities to be bipartisan. I think this is an example of it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, one of the things that I've heard from my uh, dealers is that this uh, uh, provision, not specifically this one here before us, but the uh, clunkers for cash is actually hurting business right now because people are waiting for this to pass. And since the Senate has already said they aren't taking up this bill, I'm wondering if we're hurting our dealers even more uh, by including this in a bill that's never going to uh, pass. I, I'm wondering if the Senate has agreed to pass a standalone bill and maybe we should join them with a standalone bill and I would recommend Mr. Chairman that uh, this amendment be withdrawn and uh, we could bring it up as a standalone amendment and maybe do it in a bipartisan manner. I Gentlemen, yield, yield to me? I yield. If I'll we're not acting in a bipartisan questions. way, it's not because of the reluctance on our part to ask for Republicans to be involved. We but, try to involve you. And you may not be for the bill. If you like this provision, you ought to vote for this provision. You like some amendments, vote for them. If you don't like amend other amendments, vote against them. If you don't want to vote for the bill overall, then vote for, don't vote Re for it. Reclaiming but my members time. Members have been in invited instance, to be part, part of the. Reclaiming uh, my time, Mr. Chairman. It is your time. In this instance, we have members from the Michigan delegation that are involved on another bill, including the one that Ms. Sutton's involved with, and still they weren't asked to participate. Gentlemen's time has expired. Is there further discussion? It's some Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll be uh, short. Uh, just a couple things. Uh, I, I notice in this amendment we actually have a, an amount of four billion dollars versus in the 932-page bill. Many times we have such sums as may be necessary. So I would ask the author. Why did she decide to put $4 billion in the amendment and not use the terminology such sums as may be necessary? Um, thank the gentleman for his question. Um, this, the answer is the same. I mean, we, we said $4 billion because um, you could the, economist, the economist suggested to us that this was the number that a million would cover a million cars if they were uh, based at so you you $1, went $1, in part of your negotiations you went to an economist to get a score and you calculated that 
there is actually an amount out there that we could put in parameters so when we vote for the amendment we actually know what we're voting for in the authorization is that safe to say yes thank you I, and I, I just wish we would have done that consultation more on the 10 or 14 or 15 other places in the bill where we have the terms such sums as may be necessary so I applaud you for doing that um, the, the other thing um, um, Mr. Chairman, th this is four billion dollars. I mean, this is not um, this is not chump change, and and you have me at a disadvantage because I am I am an owner of a clunker, and the uh, so what we're asking is really the taxpayers to provide me with thirty five to forty five hundred dollars of their money. To me, for the, to add in the price of a vehicle that has no value. Will the gentleman yield? Yes. Um, there's there's no requirement that you participate in this program. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So so I will be like all the rest of Americans who will look at taking a value and having the taxpayers fund. A vehicle of value, which has no value. That's in essence what we're doing. And, it, and I'm at a disadvantage. I'll probably pass on this vote because I will personally benefit if and when this becomes law. And I, uh, gentlemen, yield. I would yield. You don't have to take advantage of the program, but but you are compelled to pay taxes to fund it. But if I want to be a great environmental steward, Mr. Chairman, as you know, I do. I would be compelled because of my great concern for the environment to move from my clunker to a more efficient light vehicle truck. You don't have to ask us to pay for it. <laughs> uh, taxpayers are going to pay for it, so you don't would, have would to. Would the gentleman yield? I would be happy to yield. Thank you. And, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get you to say, okay, I'm driving a vehicle getting 12 miles a gallon. It's old. It's 15 years ago. It was another era, era of cheap gasoline. And now, you know, I'm going to go out and buy a 30 a mile a gallon vehicle, you know? And, uh, uh, and this program is going to kind of put me over the edge to break the old patterns of the kinds of vehicles which I purchased. And, and I think that program is the kind of program that we want people, not you necessarily, but people like you, uh, to participate in as we turn the corner and move to this new, more fuel efficient era. And just to be clear, the yeah. taxpayers are helping us do that. That's it is, it's the taxpayers' burden. We're asking taxpayers to fund the purchase of new cars for everyone. There's no income exclusion for everyone. Would the gentleman yield? I would. Yes. The, the, the truth is it's a win for the consumer. It's a win for backing out all the oil that otherwise we would import. And it's a win for the car It's a win for the car dealers and getting them up and going again and buying advertising uh, in the local papers and local TV stations and keeping their people employed. It's a win, win, win. Well, the gentleman yield. And the taxpayer. Well, the well, we hope it's a win also for the workers who are going to have their jobs, and when they're working, they'll pay taxes and they'll make this economy stronger. As I said, Mr. Chairman, you have me at a disadvantage uh, with this amendment. I yield back. Thanks. Mr. Inslee? Thank you. Just, uh, just a quick point. I don't have any auto workers in my district, but I think this provision demonstrates something that is important in this bill, and that is we're all moving together. And we all recognize we got problems economically and national security environmentally together. And we're not going to move unless we move together. And I had introduced a bill with Steve Israel that had a much more aggressive sort of green component of this bill. But we found a consensus that's going to help the country move forward together and is going to help a devastated industry move forward. And I may note that this consensus we reached has been criticized by some folks on the green side of the agenda. They've argued that it doesn't help the life cycle cost of these cars, because you have to manufacture a car that has CO2 associated with it when you manufacture it. To those critics, I want to point out that the cars we're helping here get off the lot largely have already been manufactured. And it's not a life cycle cost issue. It's a cost of moving forward. This is a good amendment. I hope everybody votes for it. Thanks. Is there further discussion of the uh, pending amendment? Mr. Boyer. Move to strike the last word. I just have uh, 
some questions for clarification for myself. So Ms. Sutton, it, I would be willing to yield to you. Uh, I'd like to make sure that I understand. This would be a, um, an American citizen of whom would own either an American-made vehicle or truck, an import, or one manufactured at a transplant automobile factory in the United States. I'm sorry, um, Representative, but maybe you weren't in the room when I explained it. I was in it, the room. I'm asking for clarification. Just oh, okay, okay. Um, no, this, this amendment is open to manufacturers both in the U.S. and beyond. All right. All right. Now, all right, then that, that answers that question. Any type of vehicle that's driven on the road here in the United States, manufactured anywhere in the world, would be eligible under, under, the, under this. No, so, no, no, that's, that's incorrect. Would you yield? Would the gentleman sure. yield? Um, well, certainly there are other parts to this amendment that uh, there are certainly fuel emissions standards well, attached to, to it, and there are, there are limits on the price of the vehicle that can be used, and there are other, there are other limits within the amendment. I got it. I got it. Since uh, agriculture has been exempted out of this bill, and now you've added this amendment, um, in order for this to ger be germane, are you also exempting farm trucks and grain trucks from this amendment? Um, no, I'm not exempting anything. And I'm not really certain about the first statement you made about agriculture or otherwise. So perhaps I'm not the right person to answer this question. Mr. Yeah, Braley, Mr. Ask, Braley, however, council. can. Council, would uh, farm trucks and grain trucks be in included in this under categories two and category three of the definition of trucks? Uh, the, uh, the amendment doesn't break down, doesn't specify the type, of the, the type of vehicle by use and which vehicles are eligible by use. Vehicles fall into categories uh, and uh, there, there are vehicles, uh, work trucks, are eligible to be turned in and traded for a, a and receive a voucher for purposes. Would council please talk into the microphone? So, so, the, so the council, I just want to make sure that we're not incongruent. We have a bill that exempts agriculture under tra cap and trade, yet there's an amendment here that will include agricultural pickup trucks and grain trucks and things that are used on the farm. Uh, it would include any, uh, any work truck up to 10,000 pounds. Does this, um, a Category 3 truck to council, are these, when you say work truck Category 3, are these also dump trucks? Uh, they're all vehicles up to, 10, all trucks up to 10,000 pounds. Uh, I, I don't believe there's any dump trucks that yeah, fall into that would, category. It would not be then. These are primarily large pickup trucks. And it doesn't matter with regard to the engine, whether it's a, a diesel engine or a, Regular gasoline doesn't matter, does it? It does not, as long as it meets relevant standards. Okay, thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yield. No. Uh, you're asking me to yield? Well, I'm just he had a minute Mr. and a half. Mr. Boyer, have you com have you re re yielded back your time, or you want to yield to Mr. Murphy? Sure. Th thank you, gentlemen. I just have a, a quick question for the. Uh, for Ms. Sutton on this, uh, regarding this uh, bill. I, with regard to the types of automobiles that will be involved in this, we recognize that some of the imported vehicles may come from countries that themselves have a large carbon output in their own manufacturing, et cetera, uh, which should concern us, especially regarding the discussion we just had about manufacturing and concern about other vehicles coming over or, or other steel coming over other products and putting tariffs on them, et cetera. Uh, and I don't know if there's anything in this that actually protects if a lower priced vehicle may come from another country that has uh, no pollution controls in their plants, et cetera. Um, I, I was wondering if, if the general lady would consider putting anything in this that would restrict it to either countries that have a, a smaller carbon output or at least, to, uh, at least vehicles assembled in the United States. And I yield to the general lady for answer. Yeah, and I thank the gentleman for his, uh, for his question, and I appreciate your commitment on this issue because I know that uh, it extends beyond beyond what we're discussing here today. Um, the answer on this particular amendment is that is, not, um, that is not protected in this amendment. 
However, I will say to you that I, this, is, this is not the be all, end all, only thing we ever have to do. And so I continue that fight with you outside the parameters of this amendment. Uh, the fight that we're on the same side. Yes. Thank you. Yield back. Time has expired. I blame. Can I just have? Yeah, gentlemen. Uh, for just, gentlemen, one seconds. question. There are actual businesses out there, Ms. Sutton, that, that rent a wreck. And uh, would it be your um, intention that um, these types of businesses do not use this provision for fleet replacement? I'm just rather curious. You know, every time we create a program, someone tries to take advantage of what we create. And I was just curious. Um, I, I'm, I'm not certain exactly how that would work with rent -a rec because when you, when you trade in the vehicle, the vehicle's drivetrain and engine are, are uh, destroyed. So I'm not really sure exactly what your question is. Well, th they would. Gentlemen, another word. gentlemen, yield to me. Is that, I, I, I would. Think, I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Upton raised the point that as he expressed it, this is one person, one registered owner for one year has this opportunity. Okay, as opposed to a commercial individual who may buy a fleet. Okay, that's, that's helpful to okay, me. Thank, thank you, you very much. Further discussion on the amendment? Mr. Chairman. Let's see if there's anybody on the Democratic side. Not that you have to speak. Mr. Chairman. And on the Republican side, not that you have to speak, but if you're seeking recognition, Mr. Walden. I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you wish to pursue your point of order? Uh, no, I, uh, at this point, I, I, um, I, I would request to strike the requisite number of words. Okay. Do you withdraw your point of order on this amendment? Uh, yes, I would withdraw my Thanks. point of order. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes to speak on the... Thank you, Mr. Board. Chairman. I just have a question of, of counsel. Who gets the credit for the voucher? There, is there an income issue here from a tax perspective? I know when we give a tax credit for a vehicle, there's an income issue. Is there, a, is there a value associated to somebody for this voucher? And if so, whom? Right now, the amendment is silent on that issue. So it would be taxable. So does that mean it's a taxable event to the dealer or to the individual? I, I believe our intention I, I can't. You got to get real close to these mics. Is the problem? I, I believe our intention is that it would be neither. That is your intention, yes. but the amendment is silent. So therefore, it is at the present time it's a taxable event, and I assume that's the case because we lack the jurisdiction to deal with the taxable issue. Is that correct? Uh, I, I Maybe, Miss Sutton. That's probably better of because it's more of a strategic issue that's here. That's correct. Then, okay, so. How do we know? I, I, the reason, part of the reason I ask that is obviously this is designed to incent people to buy vehicles. I get that. That's easy. Just like the tax credits are for hybrid vehicles. Unfortunately, we bump up against the AMT. Some people do in America, and those who are probably going to race out and buy cars based on this have jobs and may be the ones in the income category that will bump up against AMT, which negates the uh, effect of, in the case of hybrids, the tax credit. You lose it. And so it doesn't help. And what I'm trying to figure out is how do you thread that needle here if you're not doing it in this bill? We have to work with those who uh, have the capacity to do that in other venues. And have, have you had any discussions with those in other venues who have that capacity or gavel? Yeah, Say, that's what I meant. And, uh, and are, they, means committee. are they willing to work with you on this? Absolutely. And, and work with you in the way that you are satisfied there will not be an AMT consequence to this bill? Um, well, you know, I, I can't speak for them. All I can I? do is work with them and continue that mission. I would certainly appreciate uh, your support as well. Well, for, for this to be very effective, I, I would hope that that would be addressed. No, I don't think Otherwise, so. you have a de facto income limit in the bill. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to yield my friend from Florida. Um, if it turns out that you um, have a home in which you sell it for less than the mortgage and the bank forgives the balance, you've got to declare it as ordinary income. So wouldn't a taxpayer who goes in to buy a new car and gets a, 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 a reduction in the price and then the government must wire, the, the government wires the money to the dealer after he shows 
that he sold to me this car, the money's wired, wouldn't I have to declare ordinary income on that? It's not our intention that that would be the case. But isn't that legally? Wouldn't that the IRS would say, I, okay, Mr. Stern's got an ordinary income. The negotiated price was, let's say, 25000 And after this, the difference would be I would have to pay ordinary income, wouldn't I? I don't know, to be honest with you. Well, how are they doing I think, it in Germany? I, I think we'd have to... to what about the author of the bill? Can she tell us what they're doing in Germany? It's been quoted that other countries are doing this. How are they doing this? Does the taxpayer have to, does the buyer of the automobile have to pay ordinary income on the difference? Does anyone know? The, either the author of the amendment or anyone? Deaf ears, okay. All right. Would, would I, I, need to I need to reclaim my time for one other quick question. Is there anything in here that prevents the seller of the new vehicle from uh, using only this voucher reduction amount as the negotiating piece. In other words, uh, people can come in and, and the taxpayers are going to write down $4,500 per car or 4000 per car, whatever it is. Does that mean, doesn't that give the dealer then the ability to just go off list price? I, as the buyer, still am going to come in 4000 below and, and the the seller of the vehicle, I know they can't charge an additional fee. I know there's a limit. Is there anything in there that says how they negotiate this deal? Looks to me like you could have a real windfall. My, I, I yield to my could, colleague. Could I Michigan. just ask, this discussion is getting a little prolonged. Can I ask an additional two minutes for the gentleman uh, from Oregon? Will that shorten the time or prolong? I, I hope. I hope that it'll, it'll shorten. I, let, I would assume it prolongs it, but me, it might be and, good. And let me just say this: without objection, the gentleman would be given two additional. And, and it, I you. might say, if the gentleman. Uh, do you Ohio, wish to yield oh. to Mr. Uh, I suppose. I, if the gentleman lady from uh, Ohio would listen, and my friend uh, Mr. Stupak as well, as I understand this, there there should be no consequence to the purchaser of the new car. The purchaser is going to go to their favorite car dealer. They're going to negotiate the best deal that they can for that new 09 or 010 vehicle. And at that point, if they have a clunker that qualifies uh, better than or lower than 18 miles per gallon, the dealer will accept that car, which will be scrapped within, I believe, 48 hours. They'll certify that that will happen, and, and uh, the car will be previously owned, operated, and driven for the, for the previous year. And the price, the best price that he or she negotiates from the dealer will be subtracted by either thirty-five or forty-five hundred dollars, depending upon the new mileage uh, requirements, whether it's four, better than four or ten miles per gallon. And the consumer then will, ninety-five percent of them, will finance that car versus paying cash right. at that price. Can I they won't pay. Can I reclaim my, yes, my time for a second? Because I'm trying to work through this transaction in my head. I take my clunker in and I trade it in. Normally, that dealer would give me some value for that clunker. And that clunker, it, oftentimes, the used car is worth quite a bit in terms of the overall sale. This used car has no value other than scrap now. So instead of being worth ten thousand, it's worth whatever well, whatever the scrap market is, right? Well, if the if the because they have yield, to destroy it. If it's worth more than ten thousand, chances are, unless you want to be good for the environment like Mr. Shimkus does, uh, you're going to want ten thousand dollars for it, and not the forty, and you won't be uh, eligible to to participate right. with the. With uh, the, 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 the reason I the reason I ask that is it looks to me like, well I'm out of, I'm going to be out of time here, but two minutes that that the whole. Th th there's more that needs to be thought through on this whole idea because it, it looks to me like if I got a trade in that's five years old, so it's worth six thousand or seven thousand. You, you'll get that instead. You, you'll not want to participate in the clunker program. You'll only really want to get it if your value is less than $4, right the four thousand right. dollars, as long as it doesn't have a taxable consequence. Yeah, right. Gentlemen, uh, time has expired. The, there are tax issues. We don't have jurisdiction over them. Ways and means will be reviewing this. And it's not our intention that this be a taxable event, but that's ultimately up to them. Mr. Chairman, can I strike the last word? Yes. Yeah, you know, on this whole thing Go about back. vouchers as a taxable and all that, dealers right now and the manufacturers are offering you discounts. 
Some are equal to this amount here. You don't claim that on your income tax. That's not going to trigger the AMT for you. If you get a discount, you don't say, oh, General Motors gave me this discount, therefore I have to claim it on my income tax. Uh, this voucher program is basically the same thing. You don't have to claim it on your tax or afraid you're going to get bumped in a new tax bracket because you got $4,500. Uh, that, that's, that's, you don't declare it as income. That's okay, sort of no. no one envisions it that way. I don't know how you guys come up with that kind of idea. Wait, ahead, it's Mr. the IRS. Code. Would the gentleman from Michigan yield? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, a lawyer that I'm, I wasn't a tax attorney, but the first premise is that uh, there's a difference between negotiating a price down and being handed money. The IRS makes a distinction between that. So if you walked in the dealership and found a $100 a bill on the floor, that's taxable income whether or not you claim it or not is a different thing. So when you're talking about a voucher where you're being handed money versus a negotiation where a discount is part of the negotiation, that's a whole different item. And so that's why well, the question of whether it was coming from the dealer or the government uh, makes a difference in this. I yield that. You, you get it from the dealer, you get it from Jim if you get a discount right now. Before this program, go buy one tomorrow. And You're going to get some discounts. Some of them are as much as $6,000. The value of the car that you buy, and it's a negotiated. Oh, I don't well, want wait, to no, no, IRS. No, no, then, when you, then when you buy the car, every state's a little different. They may tax you. got to do your sales tax. They may tax you on the total value of the car, not what you paid. Some will tax you on the value of your car minus your trade-in. So every state's a little different. And if you remember correctly, when you fill out your 1040 forms, when you do your IRS, you can actually write off that amount of that sales tax on your federal income tax. So we don't see how it's going to be a tax boy venti if you t take advantage of this voucher, yeah. which you're probably putting it down on your down payment on your car. I mean, I think guys are really splitting hairs here. It's, it's a good amendment. Let's support it. Let's move on to this legislation. Gentlemen, Will the gentleman yield? Sure. I, I, I take a little offense to that because I, I'm just trying to get an answer, and I've heard from... Yeah, no, I'm not from the, the council that it may indeed be a taxable event. And I've heard from the chairman, we don't have jurisdiction, they're well, going to work it how out. How many of you, how many of you bought a new car and received the manufacturer's discount but, counted on your income tax or put it in there as a income from that's General different. Motors? That, that, that's the whole point. This is where the government, the taxpayers are writing somebody a check. Would the gentleman yield? I'll yield to I Mr. Think Mark. Yeah, I'm trying to restate, sort out. Let, let me make it again very clear. Our intent is for this not to be a taxable event. We are going to work to the best of our ability to make that clear in our bill, and we are going to work with Ways and Means, and we are already in communication uh, with the Ways and Means Committee, and they have made it clear to us that they embrace our goal uh, to ensure that it is not a taxable event. And so at the end of the process, you can have a pretty high assurance here that it will not be a taxable event. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Yes, gentlelady from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Blackburn. I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. I do have a question for the sponsor of the bill uh, pertaining to what will happen when these cars are crushed or shredded and the dealer participation in that. Reading the bill on page 7 where it gives the instructions for the vehicle to be crushed or shredded and that will include the drivetrain and also the engine. Then a little further over on page 10, it says that the dealer will disclose, or on page 9, it says the dealer will disclose the trading um, to the person trading in the eligible trade in vehicle the best estimate of the scrappage value of such vehicle and to permit the dealer to retain $50 of any amounts paid to the dealer for scrappage. So in reading this, I want to be certain I'm able to answer the question that I'm getting from both my new car dealers and my used car dealers about this provision. And that is that the dealer will bear the expense of having that car crushed or shredded. The dealer will bear that expense. And that from that, they can strip and sell prior to crushing and shredding they can strip and sell component parts of that car for scrap that they can retain as much as fifty dollars of that but before they go through that process they have to tell the individual that is trading that car how much they think they will get from scrap am i understanding that correctly yes 
Thank you. So then the dealer will be the individual who bears that cost. And I yell to the gentle lady. Um, as you described it. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. Yield back. Lady, uh, gentle lady yields back the time. Are we ready for the uh, question? Are we ready for the consideration of this amendment? If so, let's proceed to a roll call vote. Those in favor of the Sutton Amendment, vote aye. Those opposed, vote no. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Waxman, aye. Mr. D Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle, aye. Mr. Markey. Aye. Mr. Markey, aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher, aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, aye. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Mr. Green, aye. Ms. Gett, Mr. Gett, aye. Mrs. Caps, Mrs. Caps, aye. Mr. Doyle, Mr. Doyle, aye. Ms. Harmon, Ms. Schakowsky, Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Gonzalez, aye. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, aye. Mr. Weiner, uh, Mr. Weiner, excuse me. Mr. Weiner, aye. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Barrow. Sorry, skipped him, didn't I? Mr. Barrow, aye. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Butterfield. Is that him? I know. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, aye. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, aye. Ms. Castor. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Space. Mr. Space votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Ms. Sutton, Ms. Sutton, aye. Mr. Braley, Mr. Braley, aye. Mr. Welch, Mr. Hill, I apologize. Mr. Hill, Mr. Hill votes aye. There we go, I'm not there. Mr. Barton, Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall, Mr. Hall votes no. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns, Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal, Mr. Whitfield, Mr. Shimkus, <laughs> Mr. Shimkus, present. Mr. Shattuck, Mr. Shattuck votes no. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer passes. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Ms. Bonomack. Ms. Bonomack, aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden votes aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry passes. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick, Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan, yes. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania, aye. Mr. Burgess, Ms. Blackburn, Ms. Blackburn, no. Mr. Gingry, Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise, no. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, aye. Okay. 
I'll do it. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Miss, Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel votes aye. Miss, Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, aye. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon, aye. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, aye. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky, aye. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson votes aye. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer is off pass on aye. Mr. Terry. Okay. Let's see. Mr. Terry, aye. Have all members responded to the vote? I know that there are some members who serve on the Ethics Committee and have had to excuse themselves to attend a meeting of that committee. And while they may not make it back in time to vote, I hope we will allow them to insert in the record a statement of how they intended to vote on this so they can uh, have their constituents know their views. Sure. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Yes, gentlemen, state is parliamentary. Inquiry. I have an amendment at the desk that was structured as an amendment to the chairman's amendment in the nature of a substitute that is on the same issue as the amendment that was just adopted. I don't see any reason, since she refused the unanimous consent request, to, I mean, I can't offer it as it's currently structured at the desk because it's, it's not, I mean, it, it's to the base bill, but it's, it, it, it constitutes an issue that is the committee has just addressed in a positive way. Well, Mr. Barton, this is we are in the middle of a roll call. Oh, I thought I and, thought we had and, the roll call. Uh, yeah, we were just about to close the roll, I but apologize. now a bunch of members have shown up, so let's uh, let's continue the roll call. Okay. okay. I apologize. Mr. Chairman, there's I can call their name. Okay. Please call the roll. Yes, sir. Mr. Welch. Aye. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Butterfield. Aye. Mr. Butterfield votes aye. Let me go. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut votes aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes aye. Are there any other members who wish to respond to the roll? I think the uh, members of the Ethics Committee uh, did, did uh, get here in time to cast their vote. Uh, so uh, without a Without any other responses from members, the vote will be closed and the clerk will tally the vote. All right. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, the ayes were 50, the nays were 4, and there was one present. 50 ayes, 4 noes, and 1 present. The amendment is overwhelmingly agreed to. Mr. Walden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you have, uh, are you seeking recognition to offer an amendment? Yes, sir, I am. Uh, and it's an amendment to this title? Yes, sir, it is. And I will ask. Uh, it's Walden-018. I believe that's how it's designated, sir. May we be informed whether this amendment is, it's got to have been around at least two hours. We've been around. Since 1119, I believe. The Not that we The took amendment note appears of that. to be qualified with <laughs> the clerk report the amendment and May we have it distributed to the members. Amendment to H.R. 2454 offered by Mr. Walden of Oregon. Page 17, line 13, page 111, line 5, and page 545, line 13, strike the definition of Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. Uh, 
The chair will reserve a point of order. And um, a gentleman from Oregon is recognized to uh, speak on his amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The amendment before you amends uh, the bill in about three locations, and this deals with biomass, woody biomass off uh, America's forests. I want to read from you or to you from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and their words about uh, forests. And I quote, in the long term, a sustainable forest management strategy aimed at maintaining or increasing forest carbon stocks while producing an annual sustained yield of timber, fiber, or energy from the forest will generate the largest sustained mitigation benefit. That's page 543 of the IPCC report. They go on to say um, on that page, mitigation options by the forestry sector include extending carbon retention in harvested wood products, product substitution, and producing biomass for energy. The carbon is removed from the atmosphere and is available to meet society's needs for timber, fiber, and energy. Biomass from forestry can contribute 12-74 um, EJ per year to energy consumption with a mitigation potential roughly equal to 0.4 to 4.4 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year depending on the assumption whether biomass replaces coal or gas in power plants. And they go on to say, Forest mitigation options include reducing emissions from deforestation, forest degradation, enhancing the sequestration rate in existing or new forests, providing wood fuels as a substitute for fossil fuels, and providing wood products for more energy intensive materials. To wit, this is what we are talking about. There is a firm in my district, and these are all over the country, frankly, that take woody biomass and convert it into a compressed product that can replace energy types such as coal can also generate heat very efficiently. Unfortunately, what the underlying bill, the amendment by the chairman does, it contains language that basically puts America's forests most in peril, those most bug infested, most diseased, most in need of treatment. The condition class two and three lands as defined by the Forest Service fundamentally would be off limits that for this biomass to be treated as a renewable energy source a biofuel source, um, and therefore would deny these uh, opportunities to turn that woody biomass into a new market to create jobs and to create renewable energy that, as I have just cited from the IPCC's own findings, is a very productive way to, uh, to reduce carbon emissions and to uh, have a new alternative energy source. So my amendment to uh, H.R. 2454 and the underlying amendment fixes that definition. Principally, the issue that comes before us that affects the federal forests is the language on page 20 of the uh, Amendment in the Nature of a Substitute, line 11, which says that old growth or mature stands, biomat biomass material from old growth or mature stands would not qualify. So you say, well, why is that an issue? Well, the definition of mature forests as uh, defined by the Dictionary of Forestry is, quote, of trees or stands pertaining to a tree or even age stand that is capable of, and I am quoting here, sexual reproduction other than precocious reproduction, has attained most of its potential height growth or has reached merchantability standards. Note within uneven age stands, individual trees may become mature, but the stand itself consists of trees of diverse ages and stages of development. So when you ask the professional foresters, Society of American Forestry, when you ask the Forest Service professionals what does excluding old growth and mature forest stands mean to them, they will tell you it means principally you would not be able to take the biomass out of those forests and use them for energy production, which is the underlying intent, I think, of this legislation is to be able to transfer that biomass into energy, clean energy production, electricity, um, heat, and, and other things. And reduce uh, fires. We in this country have had catastrophic fire on our federal forests. Nine million acres a year go up in flames. Forty-seven percent of the Forest Service budgets consumed fighting fires. We have four million acres in the Northwest of condition class two and three lands that are out of whack with nature. At the current rate of treatment, 100,000 acres a year, you have a 79-year backlog of treatment. So if you want to do what the IPC says we should do, and that is effectively manage America's forest lands, then you need to adopt the, this amendment to fix this one problem 
in the biomass definition, and I urge your support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I rise in opposition to the Walden uh, Amendment. Uh, we have come a long way on this issue, and, uh, and a lot of it is uh, because of the um, education which Mr. Walden has you know, given to the committee over the last couple of years, and we appreciate that. Um, and uh, uh, as the gentleman knows, um, uh, two years ago when we were debating this, biomass was not on the table. And now it is not only on the table, it is on the table in a very significant way. Um, but the problem here is that this biomass definition amendment would provide federal incentives for biomass without the kinds of safeguards which are necessary. There are no safeguards at all for private lands and very weak limited protections for federal lands. The renewable electricity standard will create big incentives for biomass and done right. It will create good, clean energy jobs and clean renewable power. However, done wrong, it will destroy native grasslands and native forests, increase global warming pollution, and undermine U.S. standing uh, to ask other nations to save their own carbon-rich native forests. Depending on how and where biomass for electricity comes from, it can either help reduce global warming pollution or make it worse. Sourcing safeguards are critical for avoiding the negative impacts, like harvesting mature trees, plowing up native grasslands, or converting natural forests to plantations and releasing vast quantities of carbon. In my view, this amendment takes the wrong approach to biomass because it eliminates all sourcing restrictions for private lands. This undermines the goals in many other parts of the underlying bill, including wildlife and natural resource adaptation. It provides credits for biomass without safeguards for imperiled wildlife habitat. It just doesn't make sense to cut down, grind up, or plow under critical wildlife habitat to feed power plants. There are plenty of other sources of biomass under our definition. This provision also provides credits for biomass without any protections against the loss of natural forests. Native forests provide habitat for 90 percent of the plant and animal species that live on land, and they contain huge stores of carbon. That doesn't mean that these forests need to be off limits. We can, and under the compromise definitions, do provide credits for biomass from natural forests while encouraging practices to keep forests forests. The compromise definition has clear safeguards to ensure federal incentives don't drive the conversion of these vital lands into tree farms. The definition in this amendment does not. So what we have here is a balance that we've struck. We've come a long, long way. 80 percent of what the gentleman was talking about a couple of years ago is now included. But this amendment fails to protect the core values on federal lands by leaving important, sensitive lands like the wilderness study areas and the roadless areas vulnerable to industrial biomass sourcing, and uses vague language that opens old growth and mature forests to damaging uh, logging. We need these lands left alone to store carbon and to give wildlife and plants a safe haven for adapting to uh, climate change. That's the balance which was struck, uh, and uh, I do oppose uh, this amendment, uh, and I yield back the balance of my time. Somebody strike. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Further discussion on the uh, pending am Walden Amendment? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barton. Um, I rise in support of the Walden Amendment, and I'm going to make a few brief comments, and I'm going to yield to the author. Um, I want to point out that this amendment, the definition of renewable biomass in this amendment, was included 
in the Senate passed Farm Bill, uh, which passed the Senate on December the 14th, 2007, by a vote of 79 to 14. I also want to point out that the definition of renewable biomass that Mr. Walden put forward is identical to the definition in H.R. 1190 uh, that's currently <coughs> currently in play. It's in the in the committee. In other words, it's it's jurisdictional to this committee, and it's got five members uh, of the committee as co-sponsors, including Mr. Barrow, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Ross, Mr. Stupak, and Mr. Walden. Um, we apparently have a disagreement between what's currently in the base bill under consideration and the Walden Amendment about what you do in terms of an actively managed tree plantation, what you do uh, in terms of a federally recognized timber sale, what you do in these wilderness study areas, what you do in these old growth or mature forests, some of which are in desperate need of, um, of management. And under the bill, they could not, they wouldn't qualify, but under the Walden Amendment, as I understand it, they would qualify. Um, this would seem to be an amendment that we could accept uh, in terms of the authors of the uh, manager substitute, uh, because this seems to me to be something that's just basically good common sense. With that, I will yield to the author for any uh, comments he wishes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, ranking Member. And I, I, to, to the uh, comments by my friend from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, um, and I, I appreciate your being attuned to biomass as an issue, and I, I, I do appreciate that. But we don't waive any federal law here. We don't waive any state law. There would have to be a full NEPA done. They have all these forest management plans in place. We don't waive any of that. All of that activity and all of the law and all of the regulation, whether it's the Endangered Species Act, Fish and Wildlife, all those consultations, all that goes on. All we're saying is at the end of all that process, the material that is taken out of the forest, what you do with that material shouldn't matter where it comes from. The material should be used for whatever its, its market is. What this legislation underlying does is say, but if it comes off a certain stands, then we're going to say that woody biomass is not treated as renewable, but this woody biomass is. That makes no sense to me. They could be man effectively what happens on the federal forest system, and I live and breathe this every day. I've got 11 national forests in my district. I've got 20 percent unemployment in these communities. They don't understand why we stand around wringing our hands while the forests burn up, and the biggest economic development thing they have is making lunch for the firefighters every summer. When we do go in and get approval to do the treatments, and we don't alter any of that in my amendment, all we're saying is the material that comes out we ought to put to the highest use, and that may be woody biomass. There are companies that want to invest in producing electricity from the debris that's removed from the federal forests, but under this legislation in most of my district, I would tell you that woody biomass wouldn't count toward your renewable electricity standard or the fuel standard or anything else. It goes in a separate pile. Oh, but if it comes off of this type of forest, then it counts. Now, you tell me in a lumber yard, in a, in a, in a mill yard, how they're going to sort out which debris came from which part of the forest. We can create jobs here. We can do the right thing for the environment here. But to say we've dealt with woody biomass in a, in a wonderful way is, is not really the case when you then have this underlying hook of language that says, oh, but if it comes off a mature forest or an old growth, then that material doesn't count as renewable. But the same debris off a, a different type of forest does count. I mean, I don't, I don't get that. And, and what you're going to end up here with is, is enormous litigation over the term mature forest. What you're going to end up here is, on paper, a biomass set of provisions that simply will not be used on your federal ground. So instead, we're going to fight fire. We're going to release far more carbon into the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases that, for example, last August choked the whole Rogue River, the Rogue Valley in southern Oregon by the fires in northern California and around southern Oregon for a month. 
you could hardly breathe. I'd like to do something about that. We can create a market here to do that. We don't, we don't affect any of the environmental laws with this amendment. We, we simply say that the debris that comes off Federal land or private land should count as woody biomass for renewable energy production. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Stupak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, knowing the author of the amendment and all the work he's done in, in forestry areas uh, as we have, is, it's well intended. And I agree with most of what you say. When we started with this legislation, we had one definition of biomass that most of us could not live with. Through six, seven, eight drafts, uh, we're, we've got a pretty good definition of biomass. I think most of the things that you've pointed up, we've corrected. In fact, the, the Farm Bill, maybe Mr. Barton brought it up, uh, some, a lot of us had co-sponsored Hersa Sandlin legislation. And we probably have 98 to 99 percent of that language in our definition in the substitute here. So I think we've come a long way. And, and in, whether it was the cash for clunkers or even this legislation, there were a lot of negotiations going back and forth, and that's where we've reached this uh, accommodation. So I, I would reluctantly oppose the definition. I understand what you're doing, or I oppose your amendment, just because we've worked so hard to get to where we are. And I think we're there. I, I know but, you have a little bit more roadless, non-inventory roadless area out west than we do in the Midwest or in the East. And that's probably the only biggest difference I think I see in the would, definition. Would you yield? Sure, yield. I, I appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate the, the, uh, the work that has been done. I guess, I guess the point I'm trying to make, and maybe I'm just not doing it clearly, is you're not there if, you're, if you want to use woody biomass off federal land. You're not there with what's in this bill. Because, for example, let me, let, let me give you an example. On, on, the, on the slopes of the Rockies, and, and my colleague from Colorado can appreciate that. You have all that lodgepole pine that's bug infested, beetle infested, dead, dying, right? I would tell you that virtually none of that debris will count under this definition because lodgepole pine, once it's bug infested, is generally a mature forest. So all that lodgepole, just like they're dealing with in Canada and, and we're dealing with in the West, that is bug, beetle infested would be a mature stand under this language. That's the language at issue here is the, the definition of a mature forest. That's what I'm arguing about. But reclaim my yes, time. Yes, of course. But whether you're in Michigan or in Oregon or wherever, right. if you want to put up any timber sales, it has to go through the Forest Service. Right. You have to go through the process. Right. And those bug infested areas, right. the mature forest, many times they'll allow you to go in and clean right. them out. It's a timber sale, right. and you're going to bid whatever you think that value is. If right. it's going to be biomass or if it's going to be but, log but, pole, right. that's what's going to sort of determine the right. value of that bid. Absolutely. So you still have access to it. Absolutely. But the point is. you take it and use it for biomass. But it won't count toward your renewable electricity standard. It won't count toward your biofuel standard. You disqualify it by saying if it comes out of a mature forest, it does not count. That's the language in the bill on page 20. But, it, but if you take a look at the, the, the language there, you're allowed under timber sale to use it in woody biomass in the right. language we finally negotiated. That, that is true, except that it won't count toward the renewable energy standards. That you lose the incentive to do it. It doesn't count woody biomass that's converted into a liquid fuel. Right. If it comes off of uh, the deal we've, we've dealt with with uh, Stephanie Hurst of Sandlin and me and you and others, remember how they said if, if it comes off basically federal land, it doesn't count? It, most of the woody biomass that would be used for uh, conversion into power and fuel will come out of those types of stands we just discussed, the lodgepole, the dead dying. The problem is when you come over here and look at the market force being created as renewable energy source, it won't count. You've disqualified it. So all that stuff in the Rockies, I've got 200,000 acres of the Fremont Wyneema National Forest, a lot of which is uh, lodgepole pine that is dead and dying. They go in and clean all that out. They're going to anyway. All those other laws apply. It's just when it comes to whether or not you put that in a burner and generate electricity, if it came off that lodgepole fine forest, it won't count as renewable energy. See, our, our interpretation is that all the wood removed from federal land, right. all biomass material removed right. from federal lands is eligible for credit as long as it's not in violation of the timber right. sale that was put right. on sensitive lands. And we go right. through and we list them all what they would be. So 
we think it's it's a reasonable, inclusive standard, and but, it's still going to count. Go ahead. But but if you go to page 20, would you do that? If you go to page 20, line 11, right, got it. Then it has it, that that it does not count if if they are or it counts, but they cannot be components of old growth or mature stands. That old growth and mature stand says even if you went through everything you just identified to harvest through all the other laws. Once you get that material decked out somewhere, if it came off a mature stand, which is most likely all that lodgepole, you can't count it as biomass. That's the, the hidden killer in this bill. That's what, it all sounds good up to that point. It is that definition. So you're, you're absolutely right, Bart. You, you, the Forest Service still has to go through all those rules, regulations, to do all their sales and everything else, all the NEPA studies, all the consultations, all the environmental work. This is the point. When the material then comes out, it won't count as renewable if it happened to come off a mature forest. And I read you the definition of mature forest, which is going to be most of what we're dealing with. Well, I, I guess I'll disagree with you on that. But remember, remember the hearing we had yeah? in here when we had the uh, administrator here? We right. said, so tell us, how can you tell if that came, that tree or that biomass came from federal, forest, state, or private? Right. They can't. Right. It's basically a non-enforceable provision. Well, no, I, I, I would say it's not because line eight, line 11, uh, well, I take you. my wood off the federal land, it's right. bog infested. I right. bring it down to my plant right. where I'm putting in other trees from state or right. private land. When it comes out the end, right. how do you know that's from federal land oh. or from state land or not? They it, say it's basically enforceable. It, well, if I may, there are Go two ahead. things. First of all, you do have to account for where that came from. I mean, they, they track logs, for example. You're required to, to demonstrate there's all that system in place. Second, you also have a provision in here in the bill that says if you have a dual-fueled um, uh, source, uh, the renewable piece you have to account for differently if you sometimes augment it with petroleum, for example. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the page of the bill. You have to make that accounting. So if you're the operator of that facility, you are under obligation of this law to account for that difference. That is a requirement. And, the, and so I... Mr. Chairman... Gentlemen, uh, yes. I, I might ask to strike the last word. Well, and I'll, yield, I'll yield to the gentleman from Oregon to gentlemen, the conversation. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton, is recognized for five minutes. Would, uh, yield, I, I appreciate that, Mr. Upton. So, and would the gentleman yield to me, too, yeah, briefly at some I mean, point? I'll yield to Mr. Barton first. I just, I just want to answer... Mr. Stupak's question that he just asked, this is, this is a political distinction without a real world, real world difference. Right. Because Bart is exactly right. That's right. If you took two different boxes or trucks or whatever, containers of biomass to a location, you couldn't tell the difference. That's right. He's a, Bart's right. But you've got to certify. That's right. You're going to be you're going to be asked to fill out a form certifying that it didn't come from an old growth federal forest or a mature stand. Yeah, and if you lie about that, you're going to be subject to criminal penalties and federal prosecution. So Bart is right in in terms of just looking at it, but whoever the owner of that woody biomass is, if we don't accept the uh, the Walden amendment they're going to they're going to be forced to lie and then be subject to all kinds of penalties. No, they if so, the gentleman would so, yield. So that's the difference part. You're, if, you're telling the truth in the real world, but whoever owns it is going to have to fess up that they got it from a location that doesn't qualify. And, and actually we do as, as the federal government does prosecute uh, people who steal logs off federal land or or don't account for them properly as they should. Um, and, and so you're absolutely right, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman Barton, uh, or uh, former Chairman Barton. Um, past future. Him. Past. <laughs> future. Um, that, that's my whole point. Uh, you, it, just as Bart said, you, you go to the Forest Service, you bid on the contract, you, you, you haul out this stuff, it goes into a yard. This bill says if it came off a mature forest, it doesn't count as renewable biomass. That's what this bill says. That's what I'm trying to correct. And, and as long as we get... If you yield, sure. Well, and, as long as it was in a timber sale, right, and not of the sensitive, and it's not moved in excess quantities, 
you still counts under our definition of biomass. Unless and that's where that's where I think we disagree. No, no, if it no, it does not because you have a qualifier. Just read. Go back to page twenty, line eleven. You're going to have to certify where it comes from. It and it actually start at line eight, and it says all that's it describes all these things that are biomass, and that part my colleague from Massachusetts is right. That that's that's fine, uh, but then it says that our quote not from components of the National Wilderness Preservation System, no problem there, wilderness study areas, inventory roadless, old growth or mature forest stands, components of the National Landscape Conservation System, I could tell you stories about that as well, national monuments, national conservation areas, designated primitive areas or wild and scenic river corridors. We actually, by the way, do management work in most of those areas. I wrote a huge wilderness bill for the southern part of my district, um, the first cow-free wilderness in America. One of the management goals off of that is to remove juniper, get it back in balance. The juniper that comes out of there because it's in the national landscape system won't count as biomass. Under and, in, this bill. and in the real world, it's all biomass. Woody biomass is woody biomass. Right. It shouldn't matter where it comes from as long as where it comes from is harvested under the pertinent federal and state environmental and forest management rules. And we are trying to improve the habitat for sage grouse that may well become listed. Part of that management strategy is to remove the juniper off the range. It consumes 50 gallons of water a day. And so that woody biomass from that juniper coming off the range that might be in the NL NLCS won't qualify. Why not? Why wouldn't we create a market that creates jobs, that uses this stuff that comes out to produce alternative energy that the IPCC says is actually good for the environment because you're not necessarily burning coal or fuel oil? This all makes sense to me, and I'm, I'm struggling with, with what the problem is here. I, I yield to Mr. Stubag if he wants to. Do you want to respond? No, I, I think we beat this one to death. Uh, well, I, I believe we're okay with it. I, I can I can see where you're coming from, Greg. But uh, let let me just. I think we're still okay with it. There. Let me just conclude then. Go ahead. Just know when this becomes law. And you go home to Colorado, or you go home to where you have a federal forest. The woody biomass that comes off of that most likely will not qualify. Just know that, Would because the definition of a mature forest is such that it will disqualify that under this bill. Would what does the gentleman from Michigan think that if this bill becomes law without the Walden Amendment that the implementers of the law are not going to ask the question about where the biomass that's presented comes from? I think they will ask the question as to this ethanol made from your woody biomass. Where did it come from? What percentage was from federal and things like that? They'll probably do it. When you take the total mix, I think we're going to be okay with it. Also, having been negotiated, I said we did about eight drafts of this. I'm not naive to think that whatever we put in this is the last say on it. This is the committee substitute. We're still got to go to the floor. We got to go to the Senate. And this has been a tough negotiations we've been doing. I, there's going to be many of opportunities we're, we're, we're to try not arguing, and change it again. And I think uh, Mr. Walden raised some good points we should look at further. But uh, I, I think we've got an agreement on this side that. I have to hold to my word and our agreement on this side on this uh, definition. Mr. Markey was looking to be yielded to. Uh, I don't know if whoever has time. Well, it, the, the time has expired. My time has expired. From the gentleman Reluctantly, I from Michigan. Back. Is there further discussion of this amendment, or are we ready to vote on the amendment? If we are ready to vote, do you, do you, that's what you always say, but you've got five minutes and you don't have to use it all. Watch this time, Mr. Chairman. Um, I simply want to rise in support of the gentleman's amendment. Uh, Arizona has a vast uh, amount of acreage, indeed, I think the largest acreage in the nation uh, of the type that Mr. Walden has described. Uh, I fear that it fits in precisely the category he described and that the incentive there to clear it will not exist. We have suffered severe forest fires, and I am greatly concerned about this. I appreciate the work that Mr. Stupak has put into it and his thoughtful comments, and I hope he'll remain open-minded. Would you, uh, as we go forward, and, yeah, and yeah. with the chairman's permission, I'd be happy to yield. Yeah, would you yield on it? Uh, it wasn't just myself and Mr. Ross and others, uh, you know, negotiating this. And, and while I have my level level of comfort where we're at with the definition is in here, because the Biomass Power Association was one of the groups that were, worked with us to get this definition, and they're supportive of the language in the bill. Uh, 
because we've, we've come a long way. So, so they're supportive. They're comfortable with our position that while Mr. Walden puts up some valid points, they feel like I do, we have it covered in our definition we currently have. Rick, Would I love yeah. to see a more broader expansion? You bet. With my, my district being mostly timber, I'd love to see it. But we've gone as far as we could. Uh, even the association, the Biomass Power Association, supports what we've done in the bill. So I, like I said, I'm comfortable where we're at. And I, I think the fears are, well, f m f are, you got some merit to what you're saying, but I, I, think, I think we're covered. And so there's Reclaiming a my, bi Power Biomass Association. Reclaiming my time, my only hope is that we are covered, and if we're not covered, you will listen to us on that point. I yield to the gentleman I, from uh, Washington. Or Oregon. Oregon. Pardon me. Washington was once part of Oregon, and then we gave it up. <laughs> um, I, I just want to conclude by, again, reading for you the definition of, uh, the, the definition of mature from the Dictionary of Forestry provided to me by the Society of American Foresters. Just so you know, I'm not making this up. It says that a mature forest is of trees or stands pertaining to a tree or even age stand that's capable of sexual reproduction other than precocious reproduction, has attained most of its potential height growth, or has reached merchantability standards. Note within uneven age stand, individual trees may become mature, but the stand itself consists of trees of diverse ages and stages of development. You are going to litigate this forever if you try and use biomass off most federal forest lands and have it count toward a renewable energy standard. I realize you've cut the deals. I realize the associations have cut the deals, and they've cut most of your national forests out of the deal, and they've sold a lot of us out. Of my granted time. Well, thank you very much. We'll now proceed to uh, vote on the uh, Walden Amendment. All those in favor of the Walden, Walden Amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The no's appear to have it. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a roll call. Okay, vote. we'll go to a roll call vote. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey. No. Mr. Markey votes no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher, no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Ms. Gett, Ms. Gett, no. Mrs. Caps. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon votes no. Ms. Schakowsky. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Mr. Inslee. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, aye. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner votes no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, Butterfield no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson votes aye. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Mr. Hill. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen votes no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. 
Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal votes aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt votes aye. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer votes aye. Mr. Rodanovich. Mr. Rodanovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Ms. Bonomac. Ms. Bonomac votes aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden votes aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, Pennsylvania, aye. Mr. Burgess. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn votes aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Scullis. Mr. Scullis, aye. Ms. Kowski. Ms. Kowski, no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill votes no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut, no. Ms. Sutton. Oh, I have you. I'm, I apologize. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps votes no. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney is off aye and on no. Is Mr. Gingry recorded? I don't think so. Mr. Gingry. Okay. Mr. Gingry votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, no. Have all members responded to the vote? Right. Any member wish to change his or her vote? If not, the clerk will tally the vote and announce the result. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the ayes were 26, the nays were 32. 26 ayes, 32 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. The chair now uh, Ask the gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshoo, for what purpose she seeks recognition. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk, Mr. Chairman. Is it to this title? It is. And will uh, the clerk inform us whether it has been filed timely? Two hours. It was, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the it clerk is. will report the amendment and we'll have it distributed. Amendment offered by Ms. Eshoo of California in Title I. Add at the end the following new subsection, subtitle J, Clean Technology Business 
Competition Grant Program. Section 191. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentlelady from California is recognized to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Uh, I'm going to be brief in introducing this because uh, I think that it is a clear, succinct idea. Uh, we all want uh, national, uh, a national clean uh, uh, energy businesses to spring up all over the country, region by region. And what this uh, amendment does is to authorize a new uh, program at, uh, at the DOE, uh, which will be comprised of grants um, that would be allowed to be applied for uh, by clean technology businesses in order to establish competitions in regions across the country. It's already happening in California. Uh, it is uh, starting up in Colorado. Uh, and uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And there are some really excellent and exciting examples of, uh, of what is coming out of it. Um, this is, um, uh, I think, a very important set of bookends in that we can bring together and leverage what private sector and venture capitalists are doing relative to their investments in clean technology businesses uh, and uh, what we can uh, help to facilitate uh, with an authorization uh, from the government. With gentlelady, you. I'd be glad to. In the spirit of uh, bipartisanship cooperation, we're prepared to accept the amendment. Well, uh, thank you uh, to the ranking member. I'll quit while I'm ahead, and uh, uh, thank you for your support and urge uh, the whole committee to uh, the entire committee to support it. I think it would be a valuable addition uh, to this uh, effort. Thank you, and I yield back. Do any other members seek recognition? Then uh, the gentleman from then then the vote comes on. Uh, uh, sorry, the uh, gentle lady from the Virgin Islands, Miss Christensen. No, no, no. We we haven't had a vote yet on Miss Eshoo's uh, amendment. Um, uh, let me uh, let me recognize the gentle lady from California, Miss Caps. Just to offer a brief testimony that clean technology business competitions can really accelerate the growth of clean technology companies and create jobs. Uh, even in its short lifespan in California, uh, these competitions are remarkably successful. Eighty-four percent of clean tech open alumni are still viable businesses. They have created more than 500 jobs to date, are on track to create over 1,100 jobs by the end of 2009. This is just that in California. I just want to talk about one, and just for one second, LifeCube is a Santa Barbara-based company directly benefited from this competition. They provide environmentally friendly inflatable shelters that can contain everything a family requires during the critical first 72 hours after a disaster. They, uh, this competition drives innovation, ensuring that America leads the world into a clean technology future. So I think this is a very commendable program. I think it a, a, a really speaks to its success on the limited basis by the fact that it's been accepted by the other side. And I want to salute the author and uh, wholeheartedly support this amendment. Uh, great. The gentlelady's time has expired. All time for debate on this issue has uh, been uh, completed. Uh, the question uh, now comes on adoption of the amendment. All those in favor signify by the sign of aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Uh, are there other members seeking recognition? The chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from Missouri. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. And I would ask the clerk if that amendment has been um, two hours in its uh, gestation period. It, and, uh, Mr. Bellin, is this number 595 at the core? Yes, it is. It is on electricity prices, uh, increases for residential. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir, it is. In then the chair is. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from. Excuse. We want to read. We'll, we'll wait to, while the um, while the amendment is. Uh, then we'll ask the clerk to report the amendment. Okay. Amendment to HR 2454 offered by Mr. Blunt. After section two, insert the following new section. Dispense. I, I I think we can ask dispense. unanimous consent. To the unanimous consent that we, that we uh, dispense with reading. Without objection, so ordered. The uh, gentleman from Missouri is recognized uh, to explain his. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
Uh, and on this amendment, this would require the EPA administrator uh, in uh, consultation with the Secretary of Energy to every year prepare and certify a report to the Congress on average retail uh, prices of electricity to residential users. If the administrator would determine that the average retail price of electricity sold to end users in the residential sector uh, in one or more of the census divisions, and there are nine census divisions in the country, has increased by 10 percent above the 2009 rates adjusted for inflation, then the provisions of the Act would cease to be uh, effective. Uh, and so that's, that's essentially what it does. Rather than we had the nine, I put the nine census reasons in rather than the average uh, because this, uh, this uh, legislation is going to impact different regions of the country, I believe, in dramatically different ways, such different ways that you could have uh, an overall average that didn't increase by 10 percent, but you could have a region uh, that would increase by a, a percentage well above that. Uh, for instance, in um, the state of Missouri and the census region that we would be in in our state, uh, 85, uh, around 85 percent of all of the, uh, uh, the electricity is produced by, by coal. Uh, in California, it's 4 percent. So we're clearly much more dramatically impacted than some average number in the country or than other regions in the country. And so, uh, Mr. Chairman, this just simply would say that if that increase was 10 percent above the uh, current rate adjusted for inflation, uh, then the act uh, ceases to be effective and it would have to be in essentially a ninth of the country or one of the nine census divisions. Uh, the gentleman's time has. And I would okay. yield back my time. The gentleman's time has uh, expired. Are there other members seeking recognition. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshoo. I thank uh, the chairman. Um, I, I respect the, uh, uh, the maker of the amendment, but uh, I, I'm going to speak against it because the amendment focuses on electricity rates and uh, tries to suggest that the rates are going to skyrocket under um, the legislation. Um, the substitute actually directly protects against this through allocation of allowances. Under the substitute, 39 percent uh, of total allowance value goes back to consumers via the local distribution uh, companies, which are the local electricity and uh, natural gas providers. So th that provision um, ensures that consumers will not see a substantial increase in their electricity and natural gas bills. Uh, now, uh, if there's been anything that, um, uh, that members in various clusters have been discussing uh, as we were uh, looking to shape this legislation. It was to ensure uh, that we're, what you are saying is going to happen will not happen. And that's why uh, what is built into the substitute uh, deals directly with it. And what consumers really care about at the end of the day um, is their electricity bills, not their rates, not their rates. Everyone in this country knows that one bill, besides their credit card bill, their, util ut their utility bill, and what they're paying. So I don't look at the fine print about my, what my rate is. I look to see what the total cost of my bill is. And the bill also provides really significant support to every state to retrofit old leaky buildings uh, that waste huge amounts of uh, energy and money. And the, bills, uh, the bill also requires uh, more efficient appliances which are very important, which save money for their owner every time they're used. I've changed my appliances, and I can see the difference, uh, not in the rate of my utility bill, but in the overall lower cost of, uh, of what I pay every month. And uh, the bill requires utilities to adopt energy efficiency programs. And uh, so I think all of these things that are built into the legislation uh, are directed at that once a month event that everyone in the country, every household experiences, and that is what the cost of the, their utility bill is and speaks very clearly to that. So um, as I said before, I started out by saying I respect the gentleman, but I, I think your amendment focuses more on rates. I think it's the other way around and how the bill actually directs itself uh, toward um, uh, keeping the cost low for, um, uh, for consumers.
Thank you. Great. Yield yeah. back. Gentlemen, the lady's time has expired. Are there other members seeking recognition? The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I rise in strong support of the, uh, the Blunt Amendment. I want to focus the committee's attention on, on what it specifically says. It deals only with residential electricity prices. Average retail price of electricity sold to end users in the residential sector. These are your voters. These aren't commercial users. These aren't industrial users. These are residential users, what they pay for electricity in their home. Now, the f proponents of the pending bill before us can talk all they want about all these allowances to the commercial sector, the industrial sector, specific industries. But what this says is if the retail price you pay in your home by census region goes up more than 10 percent above whatever they're paying in this calendar year adjusted for inflation, then the provisions of the Act cease to be effective. Now, if those of you that think you've got this great cap-and-trade allowance system that's going to be painless to the economy and not going to raise rates, if you really believe that, accept this amendment because it's, it's harmless. If retail electricity rates that your, your, your constituency at their homes don't go up more than 10 percent adjusted for inflation, this amendment never goes into effect. If, on the other hand, those of us that think it's going to be catastrophic to the economy and that rates are going to go up substantially, if we're right, this protects your residential consumers from that increase. It's pretty straightforward. Either we're right that this expensive cap-and-trade program is going to maybe allocate winners and losers in the industrial and, 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 and commercial sector, but it's not going to protect the residential sector. If we're right, this, this is the amendment that protects people who pay for electricity at their homes or their condominiums or their apartments. Now, we give a 10 percent fudge factor. That's, that's non-trivial. I mean, you can go up 10 percent and then adjust that for inflation. So we're not saying you can't have any price increase at retail, I mean at, at residential, but if it goes up more than that, then the, the cap and trade ceases to, to go, now ceases to be effective. Now in Europe, where they've had cap and trade, their residential rates have gone up. Okay? Now maybe my friends on the majority have designed a cap and trade program that's going to be absolutely painless. I doubt that. But if they have, this will never kick in. But if you haven't, this protects your individual consumers in their homes, apartments, and condos from having to pay because you, you, you haven't developed a cap-and-trade system that doesn't cost a lot of money. So I strongly support this. Uh, it is the uh, uh, Residential uh, Consumer Protection Amendment. And we should, we should support it. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. Mr. Chairman, am, am I correct? Uh, when, when we look at the allocation section on, on utilities, uh, the allocations that we provide in the bill uh, go back to the local distribution companies, and, and that is uh, going to be used to deal with residential rates as well as commercial and industrial. Is that not The true? gentleman is correct. So, so we do address this in the bill. Uh, it's not just commercial and industrial com com uh, consume customers that we hold harmless from this. We also hard, ha hold harmless residential customers uh, with the allocation, a rather generous one, uh, that it goes through the LDCs and, and uh, to keep these rate hikes from occurring. So uh, I think it's dealt with adequately in the bill. and, and uh, the, the amendment before us doesn't just say that we stop a 10 percent rate increase. It says that we stop our whole efforts to address climate change if, if, if it goes up. So I, I think this, again, once again, the bill has adequately addressed this need. Uh, it, it targets residential rate payers as well as commercial and industrial, and I see no need to support the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. 
Gentleman's time has expired. Other other members seeking recognition. The chair recognizes the uh, ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I uh, certainly uh, voice my support for this amendment. And you know, in, in a number of the hearings that we had uh, over the last couple of months, uh, there were a number of witnesses who said that this bill was only going to cost 13 cents a day. Well, let's make sure that it does. 10% uh, increase, uh, th this will cover them to make sure that there's, there's not a problem. If it's not 10%, if somehow this amendment goes down, I think we ought to do what, what we did with uh, what we're going to do with Mr. Rogers' amendment. It says if, if China and India aren't going to agree right away, we'll give you five years. What percent should it be? If it's not 10, if that goes down, should it be 20? Should it be 40? Should it be 50%? Where should we draw the line so that consumers will find out whether they're, they're taken care of or not? And there's another amendment that Mrs. Blackburn and I intend to offer a little bit later this evening. And that's is to make sure that we have full transparency so that consumers know why their utility bills, why their electric bills are going up. In Michigan, we, we passed, uh, our state legislature passed uh, a renewable portfolio standard uh, last year. And beginning in June or July, all of us consumers are going to see exactly what that cost is going to be per month. It's going to be on our bill. And yes, I'm going to look at it. I think most consumers are going to look at it because for the average consumer in Michigan, uh, look at Mr. Rogers here, I think it's going to go up 350 or 4 bucks a month to make sure that we have the, the adequate deal for, for wind and solar and other issues there. And Michigan consumers are going to know what that cost is. So uh, this is uh, uh, an amendment that, that uh, lets, lets people know just exactly what it's going to be. And if it's not going to be 10 percent, uh, should we look at 20 or 50 percent? And I think you'll see those amendments uh, coming forth if this amendment somehow is defeated. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Are there other members seeking recognition? Mr. Chairman. Uh, the chair will recognize himself. Oh, I'm sorry. The chair will recognize the gentleman from uh, Iowa, Mr. Braley. Uh, thank you. I would just like to point out that the language is drafted would exclude all provisions of the Act. If this, um, if this provision would kick in at the 10 percent level. So that means all of the energy efficiency provisions in Title II, which have absolutely nothing to do with global warming, would be gone. It means all of the other provisions that are part of the bill moving us in a clean energy direction would be gone, regardless of whether they were part of the overall plan to combat global warming and climate change. And so that would be one of the best reasons I know of to vote against this amendment, because it's overbroad. It would go way beyond the scope of what the amendment is intended to accomplish, which is to address the impact of global warming provisions in the bill. And it would basically gut the entire act, including many other positive benefits. And that's why I oppose it. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. And, and let's, let's go beyond that. Let, let's just say for the sake of the discussion um, that uh, a utility or a group of utilities uh, began to construct nuclear power plants. And God forbid some event with a nuclear power plant occurs somewhere in the world. And as a result, nuclear power plants, again, are not constructed. Well, that could lead to a 10 percent increase in the rate base of those areas uh, in the country that were dependent upon it. It's happened before. It could happen again. Uh, let's say, God forbid, some international incident occurs in the Middle East. Uh, that leads to a dramatic spike in energy prices. Well, um, that as well would be something that was not, in fact, caused by this legislation. Uh, let's just say, for the sake of the discussion, uh, that electric utilities, a group of them, decided to uh, decrease their industrial electricity rates and compensate for it by increasing their residential rates. Uh, rates. That, too, would have nothing to do uh, with this uh, legislation. But all of it, as the gentleman from Iowa is pointing out, would lead to a cessation of all provisions uh, in the legislation that would be unrelated uh, to those events. Uh, these, are, these are the same kinds of comments that were made after the 1990 Clean Air Act was passed. The same kind of, of, uh, uh, of uh, comments were made about how high the rates would go. Uh, but the reality was that um, within the years after uh, the Clean Air Act of 1990 passed, the, on average, electricity rates have fallen 19 percent. 
Uh, in fact, the electricity rates in the State of Missouri fell 59 percent between 1990 uh, and the year 2006. On the other hand, the Energy Information Agency projects that electricity prices will rise 3 percent uh, 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 over the next year and uh, 15 percent uh, by uh, 2030. So electricity prices have already gone up by 25 percent in the last four years. Um, the status quo is not working. Uh, the real threat to consumers uh, is that their pocketbooks could be threatened uh, by events because we haven't put in place uh, a new plan uh, that would give us uh, new sources of domestically generated uh, electricity. So for all those reasons, uh, I think a no vote is uh, recommended uh, on this amendment. Uh, I thank the gentleman for, from Iowa for the points which he made. Uh, and does he wish to continue or to yield back the balance of his Yield time? back the balance of my time. Uh, yes, I yield. Maybe, I don't know if you can answer the questions, uh, uh, but maybe better if, I, uh, if we yield to the sponsor of the amendment. What is the census division? Is that a state? Uh, there are nine in the country, and they're, so they're, they're regional. Okay. I guess my concern is, is that, for example, the state of Texas, we have ERCOT, a state, uh, it's all uh, the state of Texas, and yet we have other utilities that serve areas across state lines, so they come under federal law. How would this work in states that, uh, uh, by the census division, it would be difficult to do this? And I guess my concern, too, is that, does the EPA ever have the ability in consultation with anyone um, to modify or change something we actually pass uh, in, in a rate setting in situation? Well, they, they, there would have been two ways really to look at this, uh, I, I'd say to my, my good friend from Texas. One is you could just have a national average, but the problem is this is not going to have national average impact. Uh, and so what this amendment as drafted says is if in one of those nine regions, if in essentially one-ninth of the country uh, you have impact beyond what uh, this committee anticipates, uh, that, uh, that the uh, law no longer would apply. I, I'd, I'd say to my, my friend from uh, uh, Iowa who controls the time, you know, we could possibly modify this so that uh, only Title III wouldn't apply, where you'd still have many of the sections of the bill but you wouldn't have uh, the Title III section. Uh, the goal here is not to throw out the entire bill, but the goal here is to be sure that residential customers have the protection that the gentlewoman from California and the gentleman from Pennsylvania said they would have, but the chairman explained all the ways that residential rates could go up. And that's what we want to avoid here, a residential setting where rates go up. Mr. Chairman, if I could get two, uh, ask for two more minutes for the gentleman from Iowa so we could have exchange, and that way I won't have to ask for my time. Okay. The, the members uh, hear the unanimous consent request. Without objection, two minutes are added to the time of the gentleman from Iowa. To our colleague from Iowa and, and from Missouri, I guess my concern is by adopting this amendment, we may take it off of our responsibility, whether it's the regions or the states or, or as a nation. Uh, we didn't have any testimony that said we would lower rates by doing cap and trade or even a carbon tax, if that's, uh, since that's what your side wants to do. But I think this may be punted by Congress saying, oh, the EPA is supposed to take care of that. It's actually going to be our responsibility to, re to respond, and that's why I think this amendment may be an effort to cover in the congressional responsibility if we have a substantial increase in rates in regions. I think it's difficult for the, I'd go down the states even, but, uh, but that's our job. And so that's why I think the amendment may not be the best for this bill, because I want us to come back and revisit it on a regular basis, which I, I think we will uh, over the next 10 years that's effective. And I thank my colleague from Iowa for yielding. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Gentleman from Iowa. Well, I just wanted to comment on um, um, the gentleman from Missouri's point. And I think one of the things that's so unpredictable, and this is something that I've experienced firsthand in my first two terms, is we had a massive ice storm event that had an enormous impact on public utilities in my state. A year ago, we had the most powerful tornado in the country hit my district, which had an enormous impact on utilities in my state, followed by the worst flooding that we'd ever seen. And so when you break it down into these census divisions, 
you can't adjust for natural disasters and the regional impact that have that could cause these price fluctuations without any regard to the gains that are being made from the attempts to combat climate change. So that's why I am uncomfortable with the language even in a modified form, and I yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman yields back. Uh, are there other members seeking recognition? The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Boyer. Thank you. I move to strike the last word. The, I need the, 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 the gentleman is recognized for that purpose. I needed to uh, respond to my, my good friend, Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, earlier that you had made comment uh, re with regard that sufficient provisions were in the bill to protect consumers with regard to rate increases. And I just want the gentleman to know, um, I, don't, I do not know the electric power portfolio with regard to Pennsylvania. I, I don't know what it is. I could probably look that up. But with regard to Indiana, we are about 96 percent coal, zero nuclear, with 3 percent natural gas, and 0.4 percent renewables. So we are a highly dependent state on, on coal. And uh, um, given how the the permits are being allocated 50 percent to the CO2 emission and 50 percent to retail sales, we're going to be punished in Indiana. So with, when permits are, be, are, are handed out to take a state like, uh, according to the Edison Electric Institute, uh, EEI, the uh, California, their portfolio, 23 percent nuclear, 13 percent large hydro, 12 percent renewable, 47 percent natural gas, 4 percent coal, 1 percent fossil fuel. So they are very, very low with regard to their emissions. Indiana is extraordinarily high with regard to our emissions. And so when you look at the allocations, what is happening is uh, certain states are going to receive a tremendous windfall by, with regard to the allocation of the permits. States like Indiana, when we only get 50 percent, we are going to have to go out and then purchase those out onto the marketplace. And when those are purchased, that is a cost that is borne by someone. So with regard to our state, Mr. Doyle, in Indiana, uh, it might, you know, your comments might be helpful to a consumer in, in, in a state that has a, a good energy portfolio. But with regard to Indiana, we are going to get punished uh, and we are going to get really high rates. Will the gentleman yield? Sure. And I would just like to ask the gentleman, did you, did you take the Midwest states into consideration? Yeah. I, I would just say to the gentleman, every single one of my constituents gets their electricity from coal. <clears throat> so uh, the whole purpose of allocating 35 percent of the total pot of allocations to the electric utilities and to take those allocations and pass those allowances down to the local distribution companies is specifically so in states like yours uh, and mine that are heavily dependent on coal. Uh, that, that this can, these free allocations that are going to the LDCs will, will help mitigate these price spikes. So, I mean, this is specifically being done to help states like mine and yours uh, against this. Would, the gentleman, would you be more favorable if these permits were based on a 100 percent allocation of emissions as opposed to retail sales? I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what you mean by that. The, the third, uh, maybe the chair can clarify, but it's my understanding is 35 percent of the, of the total emissions, we are talking about some $35 billion, is, is going to flow down through the LDCs, and that is going to be used specifically to mitigate price spikes in residential, commercial, and industrial use. I'm, I'm, Mr. Doyle, I am referring to the, to the permits. As those permits are allocated, they are allocated 50 percent based on the utilities retail sales and 50 percent based on, on the CO2 emissions for the utilities. So I'm just I'm just saying, would you be supportive then if you're, all of your consumers are 100 percent coal, mine are 96 percent coal, that it would be a 100 percent? We should do a 100 percent allocation based on emissions instead of retail sales. That that avoids this tremendous windfall to states out there. Would the gentleman yield? Yeah, I'm, I was going to. Well, I, I'd, 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 would support that. I'd like to hear a clarification from staff because right. that's not my understanding. Okay, if the gentleman would yield, this, sure. this is a carefully crafted compromise with the Edison Electric Institute, led by Duke Power, you know, the largest utility in Indiana, which was the utility that basically argued for this formula for their, uh, for your consumers. 
So this is Jim Rogers asking for this formula because he felt that it was best and he was reflecting on Indiana when he was asking for it. So we were deferring here to the Indiana utility uh, as it would then relate to the local distribution, as it would relate to the, uh, uh, to the consumers Re of- Reclaim my true. time. I would submit that Jim Rogers does not speak for the consumers in Indiana. I'll yield back. Uh, are there other members um, Mr. seeking uh, recognition? Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, on this side, uh, we'll turn and recognize the gentleman from um, California, Mr. Radonovich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the time, and I too rise in strong support of this amendment. Um, we did have a hearing before this began, and former Vice President Al Gore, the main proponent of this legislation, was um, testifying before the committee and said that we would be able to essentially move from fossil fuels to to a reliance on solar and and uh, wind energy, enhance the economy, and re reduce dependence on foreign oil, all at 33 cents per household per day. And um, I find that hard to believe. I think that um, uh, we've heard estimates that uh, the real cost of this thing per household could be anywhere between $2,500 to $4,500 per year. And I kind of look at this as more of a uh, put your money where your mouth is amendment. If, if, it, if this bill does accomplish all that it does, the last thing I know that my friends on the other side of the aisle would want to do would be to raise rates, uh, residential rates and rates to consumers. But uh, there's a large body of evidence and a lot of people that believe that if you're trying to replace the fossil fuel industry with solar and wind and, and a few other things without identifying a new energy resource, the impact is going to be... Um, place a heavy burden on the economy and the individual consumer. So I think that uh, it ought to be in everybody's interest on this committee to begin to look to ways to ensure safeguards in there that when prices to consumers rise as a result of this legislation, I don't think, I, I think we need to be far less worried about a nuclear accident or any other national or world catastrophe that's going to raise rates because this bill and the effects of cap and trade are going to do it for them and everybody ought to be on board on devising some type of a system that that speaks for the residential mom and dad in their house paying the electric electric bills that are that are in, going to increase three or four hundred percent as, as a result of legislation like this so i i um i would i think uh, would hope that the the uh issuer of the amendment uh, and folks on the other side if you want to tailor this to make it work I think it's all in the best interest of the American people to be protected from uh, this kind of legislation that's going to come down of them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. Are there other members seeking recognition on the majority side? Then we'll turn back again to the minority side and recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, I rise in strong support of this amendment. Uh, I have been in contact with our uh, Public Utility Commission in Pennsylvania as to their thoughts on this legislation, and they are so concerned they've requested to meet with our uh, congressional delegation and are coming down to do that. But they provided us a written analysis uh, a couple of weeks ago of this, this legislation, and they concluded that this would result in a sizable hike in the electric bills of residential customers, among other things. I won't read all of them, but that's a direct quote. Uh, they say that they're far from convinced that the negative impacts of this legislation could have on our state's economy are fully understood and appreciated. And the cost estimates are staggering. Uh, take, for example, um, the recent study conducted for PJM, that's the regional uh, transmission organization, the RTO in which, to which uh, Pennsylvania belongs, that provides an assumed cost of $60 per short ton of CO2 emission allowances. By year 2013, they said this would result in an annual PJM-wide market impact of nearly $36 billion in higher energy prices and rate increases of over $400 annually 
for residential rate payers. Um, and whether we reach the $60 per short ton figure or not, the impact will likely be a nightmare for regulators. Pennsylvania is the fourth largest coal producer in the nation. Uh, they distribute over 75 million tons of coal each year. Roughly 7 percent of our nation's coal supply is in Pennsylvania. And 58 percent of all of our electricity in Pennsylvania comes from coal. So I, I think uh, we need to listen to experts. These are the ones in our state who are dealing with these electricity rates uh, and the minutia of them on a daily basis. Uh, they're recommending. Uh, Will the gentleman yield? And uh, yes, um, I'm sorry. Will the gentleman yield? Sure. Uh, I, I also met with, with uh, Commissioner Paulson. Uh, I didn't meet with the other. And, and Joe and I had talked about uh, having a meeting for the Pennsylvania delegation with our PUC to discuss the legislation. Uh, one of the things that came out in my meeting with Commissioner Paulson was is that they were basing this report on the draft. Uh, they were not knowledgeable nor had seen uh, the, the chairman's substitute. So a lot of these points that were of concern to them have been addressed in the bill. Uh, so what we've agreed to do is have a, a meeting with our PUC after this markup so that they have the benefit of seeing that the changes that have been incorporated in the bill and they can reanalyze the draft. And I look forward to hearing their comments once they've been able to see this. But the, the report that you speak of, and it's the same thing Paulson said to me, was based on the draft and he had no knowledge of the revisions that yeah, were made. Yeah, reclaim my time. Uh, I still, after talking to Paulson and the Democrats, not just the Republican, both sides on the PUC, have, uh, have a belief that this will have dramatic impacts on our residential rates. And I look forward to the meeting as well. But I, I think a vote for this amendment will protect uh, our consumers against significant increases in our re residential electric rates, and I urge support for it. Great. Gentlemen, so time has expired. Are there other members seeking recognition? Uh, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry. Thank you, Mr. Markey. Uh, First of all, I have two documents, uh, one identified as Mid-America Calculations of Actual Allowances Allocated uh, by Waxman Markey, which is their review of the uh, chairman substitute draft that was provided to a uh, public, and public and members Thursday afternoon. Uh, the second document is entitled Estimated Cost Impacts of H.R. 2454 on OPPD's Generating System and its Retail Customers. I'd like to submit both those for the record. No objections? Oh. So ordered. Without, a, with, <laughs> without objection, uh, it will be included in the record. Uh, I'd like to point, uh, read a few paragraphs uh, of MidAmerica's analysis of the substitute that was provided on Thursday. Uh, Met America's CEO and I met and talked um, over the weekend. Uh, he is a resident of my district, although it serves uh, most of Iowa, uh, so within a few miles of my house. OPPT uh, represents my constituents or provides electricity to my constituents. Uh, very quickly, a few of the paragraphs from Met America. Uh, first, the mythology used for allocating electricity industry allowances is not based on total economy-wide U.S. emissions in 2005, which according to the EIA was 7.2 billion tons of CO2 equivalent. If we use the 35 percent uh, figure agreed upon, the electric industry would have been allocated approximately 2.5 billion allowances. Instead, the bill uses a formula that allocates allowances from the total allowance pool of capped industries. That's an important distinction. Uh, then on page 407 of the bill, you will see the table that gives annual allowance amounts for this pool. In 2012, the figure is 4.6 billion allowances. 1% is skimmed off the top for strategic reserve allowances, which increases to 2% in 2020. Then the bill further prescribes that the industry will receive 43.75 of the approximately 4.6 billion allowances in 2012. In other words, slightly over 2 billion allowances. 
Where that 43.75 figure comes is not clear. That $2 billion allowance figure is a 16% reduction from the 2.4 billion tons of CO2 emitted by the electric power sector in 2005 as measured by the EIA. So it's accurate to say that electric power industry is not getting 90% of the allowances for free. By the way, the allowance uh, allocation for merchant coal generation is subtracted from the $2 billion, as well as an unknown amount for long-term power purchase agreements. Whatever is left, which will be well below $2 billion allowances, is distributed to local distribution companies based on a formula of historic emissions. Going through the entire package, they estimate that their 2012 costs are $900 million. Uh, OPPD, again, that generates electricity for my constituents, uh, estimates that the draft that was provided on Thursday afternoon, again, sitting down with a, a team of lawyers, uh, their estimate is that $54 million in 2012 and increasing to $410 uh, million a year by 2030 in their most optimistic case. Estimated costs based on more realistic EPA assumptions have OPPD costs ranging from $173 million a year in 2012 and increasing to $1.3 billion a year in 2030. Uh, OPPD makes the uh, point that that's just on the cap and trade, the allowance section. This doesn't even count the increased cost to meet the renewable electricity portfolio or standard. Uh, with that, I yield back. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. Are there other members uh, seeking recognition at this time? The chair sees no one on the majority. We look to the minority, and I will recognize the uh, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, there's uh, two great quotes, I think, on this. One was the pre now President of the United States when he said that the cap and trade bill would, quote, necessarily skyrocket electricity rates, end quote. My friend Mr. Doyle, who stepped out, good friend of mine, also said even in the conversation uh, that they hoped that these allocations would serve to, quote, mitigate price spikes. It is very clear to anyone who reads the language that electricity prices are going up because of this. In Michigan, and I, Mr. Upton brought up a great example, uh, not only do we have an RPS fee that's going to be associated with every bill in the state of Michigan, but both of the companies went in, and one uh, asked for an 11 percent increase, and the other is an 18 percent increase, and both are before our public commissions today. 11 and 18 percent increases. On their, uh, and, and on top of that, a renewable portfolio standard fee that's going to be charged to every consumer at the end of the month. One in three Michigan families are behind over 30 days in their electricity bill. One in three. One in three. What this bill says is we're just not going to crush you. We know you guys can't have big fancy lobbyists and who help negotiate the bill and can discuss very complicated allocations of 35 percent that really don't mean 35 percent that deal with future contract purchases and the fluctuating price. They don't care. They know that they got a refrigerator that they have to have electricity to to keep their food cold and fresh for their family. They know that when their kids get on the computer, it costs them more money to do their homework. That's what they know. And they know that they just want somebody somewhere to stand up and say, hey, what about me? What about the little guy? I'm having a hard time making my house payment, and I'm, as, as the statistics show, one in three houses can't even make their electric bill payment on time. And all we're asking is give them a break, please. Don't do this to them. Because if you're, the whole idea of cap and trade works, you've got to make it more expensive. And these companies can't absorb it all. They've got to find new ways to invest in alternative forms of energy. So if that's what you want, it has to be more expensive. And consumers have to pay for it. We, we talk about billions of dollars. Where do you think it's coming from? The poor, yeah, well, we're going to borrow it from China to try to give to the utility company that's, that has a guaranteed rate of return. Anybody think that's a good idea? And the person who gets up every day and is trying to make his job or her job work, who gets her kids on the bus and drives to work and just hopes at the end of the day somebody's thinking about them because they weren't in the room, I'll guarantee you that. 
And if you got in the room, you got taken care of. If you weren't in the room, sorry, you're going to pay for this thing. This has real consequences for real families. And all this is is an insurance marker. If you believe what you say, this, means, this, this bill means nothing. This amendment means nothing. It won't be a problem. But if you don't, and you do worry that the President of the United States was right when he said electric bills will skyrocket, and my good friend Mr. Doyle said that they're going to have to mitigate spiking prices, okay. I don't think the, the intention here is wrong, but let's build in a little protection for the little guy, the person who's still trying to build something in America, who's still trying to make their truck payment and their electric bill payment, and try to figure out after all of that, after their 401k is now a 101k, how do they get their kids through school? Let, this is the wrong time to not protect the little guy who's trying to pay these bills. The gentleman I yield? I will yield. Yes, sir. I, I, I mean, the, the biggest chunk of, of allocation, not auction, is, is specifically going to these distribution companies to pass through to ratepayers so that the things that you're talking about don't happen. But would the gentleman yield? Well, let me, let me just reclaim my time. It's very clear, uh, and Mr. Terry did a, a fantastic job of going through how the 35 percent really isn't even 35 percent. And, they, and it's submitted for the record. I'll, I'll give you a copy of it. And that's the problem when you get all these complicated allocations for people who, uh, uh, you know, this, this corporation gets this allocation, and if you build this, you get this uh, uh, allocation. And oh, by uh, you know, electric, electric, electricity producing companies, you're going to get this based on this with this formula. And I'll tell you what all of that complication means. It means the guy who's paying the electric bill is going to get the shaft. That's what that means. And that's what it clearly spelled out when they broke down the allocation. That's why this, this, because it's based on nothing. You've created this allocation cap based on what you think is right. That's the problem. It's not based on real science. You pick the cap, and then you broke a pot of money, and then you decided you were going to take 35%, and oh, by the way, here are the exceptions to that 35% and how you can spend it. And they go to the PUC and say, we're losing money. We're guaranteed a rate of return. A rate of return. You, have to, uh, you have to pay it, pay the bill at the end of the day. Oh. I, that's why. I, that's why. Just give them the insurance. That's all I'm asking. Please give these people the insurance they need. Gentlemen's time has uh, expired. Are there other members uh, seeking uh, recognition uh, on the majority uh, side? Um, all right. We'll turn again to the uh, minority and recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as we proceed on this, and I've, I've been looking at, I believe someone made a comment about this being equivalent to the rate of a postage stamp, uh, which, by the way, uh, that per day uh, comes out to about $156 uh, a year, uh, not including costs of goods made in the United States that are also going to be added to that as well. Um, and, I, and I guess that doesn't assume that uh, costs of postage stamps have gone up a third in the last 10 years, 33 uh, percent. Overall, a part of this we have to understand is, and I want to make sure you have this, if, so if steel mills are being hurt by production, they get some money back. And if, cons and if families get hurt by this, they get some money back. Uh, this reminds me of uh, the great comedian Jonathan Winters. Some years ago, he was oftentimes challenged with being shown a photograph, and he had to make up a joke about it. And he, they handed him this picture of the Eiffel Tower. And Jonathan Winters said, this is a picture of something they built in Paris so they could put a red light on top of so that planes wouldn't crash into it. And I wonder how this cycle goes and how we explain this to constituents, that we're taking the money away from you so that we can give it back to you at another rate. Uh, and that's going to, I mean, it, it begins to lose it for folks, too. I mean, the bottom line comes down to this, that we're still seeing we're having to defend a position here where we want to have clean energy. I don't think there's any question on that. But I still wonder about these tax increases and other increases that are taking place here that are going to be a burden uh, back on every family in terms of paying their electric bill, paying more for goods and services of anything made in this country. Uh, and that has to be something that we're going to have problems explaining to our constituents. And I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Are there any members on the majority side? Uh, the, the chair recognized the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd yield you my time. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding to me. Um, and it's been some time since we made these points, so I will make the points again, um, just so that they're introduced from the majority side uh, into the debate. Um, this proposal 
um, that we are working from is endorsed by uh, and supported by the Edison uh, Electric Institute. And that includes AEP, Duke Energy, NRG, Excel, Exelon, Constellation, PG&E, on and on. But it also happens to have the benefit of being uh, supported by NARU, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. It also has the benefit of being um, uh, endorsed by the National Association of State Consumer Advocates, consumer side as well. It also happens to be a formula that is endorsed by the Center for Budget Priorities. Those are the people that spend their time trying to figure out how things like this impact ordinary people and their homes. So we have worked very hard uh, and they all support this proposal uh, because they believe that it, it, that it does accomplish the goal of protecting uh, consumers. Um, I don't think that we had EEI endorsing anything or supporting anything back in 1990 or 1978 or 1970 when we were going through earlier iterations of the, you know, of the Clean Air Act until, you know, un unless and until they are completely satisfied. Um, and so, uh, just for the record, okay, this uh, uh, proposal uh, supposes something that would not have been thought through by, in each state, the, the kind of interests here that have a stake in keeping electricity uh, rates uh, stable. And I think that Mr. Doyle has done a good job over and over again in remaking this point, uh, ensuring that everyone understands uh, that uh, Mr. Boucher, uh, along with many other members, spent a lot of time with the affected utilities, but also the State regulatory um, uh, commissioners um, and others, ensuring uh, that this formula was a workable one and would, uh, as the gentleman said, make sure that we would not see spiking uh, electricity rates. So I just introduced that once again so that the members uh, can hear it, and my time has expired, uh, and I will now seek yield. to recognize. Uh, gentlemen, yield. Forty-three seconds. If, go if, I may, if I may rescind my uh, my uh, uh, sending back my time, uh, and there is no objection, then I will yield to the gentleman from Missouri. Well, I'll, I'll try to be quick in my thirty-two seconds. I thank my friend for for yielding. There, there has to be. If 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 the gentleman's right, if the chairman's right, if there is no impact, then I don't see the harm of the amendment. If there is an impact, I don't think the, the person that gets a utility bill and we say, well, the consumer advocates thought this would be good and the regulators thought this would be good and the power company thought this would be good, I don't think that's going to be a very good answer uh, to that person. So there has to be some percentage uh, where surely this committee would be willing to say if the rate goes up at some level, we'd be willing to do something. I said we could make it apply to only the th only Title III. Uh, we're willing to work here. but. This is a problem that you say won't be a problem. We say if it's not a problem, what's wrong with uh, coming up with a uh, with a uh, safe uh, safe solution? If, if, if I thank I, the gentleman. If, I, if I may reclaim my time and just to briefly say that the gentleman from Pennsylvania has already pointed out that those anticipated spikes won't be as a result of this bill. However, they could be as a result of other events that do occur. Those are the types of events that the gentleman from Iowa uh, was making reference to. Uh, a litany that I went down as well, uh, but it won't be because of this bill. But then, because of some other catastrophic event uh, that occurred, it could lead to a suspension of the entire bill, and that's the problem with the gentleman's amendment. My time has expired, um, and I will Mr. now Chairman. turn to the minority to look for other members. Mr. Chairman, recognition. Uh, uh, the gentleman from uh, Illinois, uh, Mr. Shimkus, is recognized. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. And this is an important debate. We've, we, because of deregulation in the electric utilities in Illinois, we actually saw a huge public outcry, so much that they forced the state legislature to go back and, in essence, rescind some of the, the legislation. So this could very well happen here. This is an insurance policy. Um, I concur with my colleagues that says, if, if you are right, no harm, no foul. But if you are wrong, as we call for a vote on this amendment, you are going to be on record saying, no, we are not going to rescind this bill if, if electricity costs go up 15 percent or 20 percent or what they did in Illinois, 
30 and 50 percent. Now, you know, votes have consequences, and it, that's the side that you all want to be on. But let's talk about the caps provision. When, when Mr. Boucher originally put the counterproposal on what the caps would be, they were to be 40 percent, which would be 100 percent of the CO2 emissions. Well, guess what, gang? He didn't get 40 percent. He only got 35. So there's already 5 percent of the credits that are going to be pushed on to a rate hike somewhere because it doesn't cover all the emissions. The, the draft already talks about it. It's only 90 percent. It's not 100 percent. It's not. So where, how is the additional 10 percent going to be passed on? It's going to be passed on through higher costs. And this is a protection to keep that from happening to the individual electricity user. Now, Mr. T Terry, in his analysis, direct, correctly identifies that the 35 percent is really not a 35 percent. So the question is, what is the percent? And if it's not 35, what is it? So then you take the original proposal of 40 percent, which was the, the voucher counter, by golly, we're going to get 40 percent, we're going to cover electricity generators and make sure that the cost price, then he sold out for 35. Now you check the fine print and 35 is not 35. All we're saying is you, you better have yourself covered. And you better have yourself covered with your electric utility rate payers. And, and this is not, this is a 10%. I mean, it gives you room for some increase in utility rates, up to 10%. I would think that anything over 10% would uh, be egregious and we ought to relook at the bill. Now, if you all don't think that a 10% increase in utility rates is not bad for your consumers or your constituents, then, uh, then I would invite you to rural, poor Southern Illinois. As I said in my opening statements, this bill disproportionately harms the poor. They're not buying new generation refrigerators. They're not buying new generation washer and dryers. They're traveling long distances. So any increase in electricity rates hurts the poor. And, and I'm actually really surprised that the Democrat Party that espouses the fight for the little guy are fighting for the big guy in this bill. You're fighting for the big guys. Big electric, big utilities, EI, by golly, where is big steel, all the big guys? Who's fighting for the little guy? Well, you know who is? We are, because we have a simple amendment that says well, if well, electricity we, rates go over 10 percent, we ought to relook at this bill. Will, will the gentleman yield? I would be happy to yield. I appreciate the gentleman yielding. Uh, I, I, I really don't know what the Democratic majority what their fear uh, of the Blunt Amendment is. I mean, it it's, uh, uh, calls for increase by more than 10 percent, then uh, the provisions of this act shall cease to be effective. I'm thinking back on Medicare modernization and the Prescription Drug Act. We had a provision in that bill uh, concerned over increased cost of Part D uh, that uh, if, if the overall spending on Medicare uh, reached 45 percent, threshold, uh, then the President would have to immediately notify Congress, and Congress would have to, uh, within a very short period of time, take action to bend that growth curve, to take, to, to bring that down, because it would be unsustainable. Uh, my colleagues, I think I remember shortly after Madam Speaker became Madam Speaker, uh, that this very thing happened. The President notified the Congress and the new majority, the Democratic majority, uh, that more than 45 percent out of the general treasury was now paying for the, the, the tab on Medicare uh, and not nearly enough coming out of Part B. Uh, and and the, the, the speaker, as I recall, just simply ignored that provision. So let's pass this amendment and then you would have the opportunity, assuming that she's still speaker, of once again ignoring it. And I'll yield back to my colleague from Illinois. Gentleman yields back his time. I think we've had enough debate on this amendment. Are we ready for the uh, vote? How many members wish to still speak on this amendment? One, two, three. Would you be willing to do three minutes each?
Okay, how about the other, the others of you? Will you do three minutes each? Three? I would prefer to take my full five minutes, if I may, please, sir. Okay, let's go uh, in order of seniority. Mr. Burgess. Thank you. And if Let me I point out, after the three of you, we're going to move to vote. And, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I, I would like to ask a question of counsel. Your time. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the consumer protections that we've been hearing so much about, and I can't find in the bill, and maybe you can help me, where does it say that the consumers will actually get money from the rate payers, from the distributors, rather, in this, uh, in this allocation scheme? Section 783 says it with respect to the local district. Give me a page companies. number, if you would. I've got so many bills in front of me, I don't know where I am. I'm just a simple country doctor. Well, first there of all, you're in the Commerce Committee room in the Rayburn House yeah, Office thank building. Thank you for that. No, no, no. This is, this is LDC's. Can, can you give me the page number in the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Uh, section 783 of the, the Clean Air Act uh, is on page 566. Okay, I'm with you. So the climate change consumer refund account is what you're referencing? Yeah. If the gentleman, you, is, are we, is it on page 553 that we're talking about? Is 553 the page that has the, um, the. Uh, but page 553 yes. has section 77, seven, pardon me, 782, which does say on line three and four that it shall be allocated for the benefit of electricity consumers. And how does the money actually get to the consumer? Uh, that's in section 783. Yes, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the, the distribution, initial emissions, updating. And then on page 574, uh, paragraph 4, use of allowances, heading over to page 575. Uh, it says that emission allowances shall be used exclusively for the benefit of retail ratepayers of such electricity local distribution company. Again, and how does the money actually get to the consumer through the, through the distribution company? Yes, that, that's, that's up to the distribution company to, it's to determine. Up to the distribution company. Are they compelled to give it? If council would yield, it's up, it's up to the local public utility commission to ultimately make uh, that determination. Can, can, can the public utility commission be actually forced to turn that money over to the consumer? The in paragraphs A, B, and C, it directs the local distribution companies in terms of how they are to to uh, use the allowances. It requires that they be used for the benefit of uh, retail rate payers. Uh, paragraph B says that um, they have to ensure that the benefits are distributed uh, among rate payer classes rateably based on electricity deliveries to each class. And then in little uh, clause two, equitably among individual rate payers within each rate payer class and then C provides some further limitations and direction on how the allowances are to, to be used and how the benefit is to go to the consumers. And then paragraph D 
uh, requires the administrator to pr prescribe specific guidelines. Can you t tell me what uh, the direct effect on a ratepayer in the state of Texas would be since Texas uh, is, is a non-regulated state? No, I can't tell you what the, the direct effect on ratepayers in Texas would be. It would be up to the LDCs and uh, the the LDCs in Texas to be that are regulated by the the state. Gentlemen's time has expired. I uh, will now go to the um, uh, Ms. Well, Mr. Blackburn. Chairman, this is a, this is an important point. Can I ask for an additional two minutes here? Objection is heard. But you can ask questions other than doing it in a public setting, if you want information. We'll be glad to have our staff answer questions to, for you, if that would be helpful. Ms. Blackburn, you're recognized for five minutes. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman will state his parliamentary inquiry. We have a pending amendment, which I believe is the Blunt Amendment, and every member of the committee that wishes to should, is under the rules of the committee, uh, is allowed five minutes to comment pro or con on that amendment. We also have a standing practice that members can strike the requisite number of words to ask questions of counsel. As I understand it, and I may be wrong because I wasn't in the room, Dr. Burgess was asking questions of counsel. Is that not correct? So technically that shouldn't count against his five minutes uh, of commenting on the pending amendment. As I understand it, we've been talking about this amendment, and I have not been in the room the full time, but over an hour and 15, 20 minutes, not everybody has to say everything about every matter because we need to move on. That, well, but this is an important thing. It is important indeed. This, this is the guts of the bill. So you, would, you think that uh, Mr. Burgess ought to have additional time? I think every member of the committee on both sides of the aisle should have sufficient time to ask questions of counsel about the bill. And I also think every member should be given, if they wish it, five minutes to comment on any amendment that's before the committee. Well, we're not going to do ten minutes per person. Well, but you've got two different issues, Mr. Chairman. Members have five minutes to use as they see fit. I think we ought to give Mr. Burgess another couple of minutes. And, uh, and then we'll recognize the other two re members on your side of the aisle that seek time. And then I'd like to put the question uh, to the members to limit the debate and move on. I thank the chair for the consideration. I'll just point out, had we had a chance to do this in subcommittee, maybe some of these things could have been resolved. Uh, section C, where it says limitation, an electricity local distribution company shall not use the value of emission allowances distributed under this subsection to provide to any rate payer a rebate that is based solely on the quantity of electricity delivered. And Mr. Rogers asked a very valid question about who is looking out for the rate payer in this, who's looking out for the end user. And it looks as if the language in this bill explicitly denies the ability to look out for the end user. The other question that is unresolved at this point is what happens as these, as these amounts are ratcheted down. Forty years from now, it's less than a third of the amount of carbon that can be emitted that is allowed in 2012. This is an important point, and it's going to affect ratepayers and end users for the, certainly the rest of my natural lifetime and well into the next several generations if something isn't done about this. And right now is the time to fix it and get it right. The Blunt Amendment would do that and allow the ratepayer to be spared the, the burden that we're going to be putting on them in years to come. And I thank the Chairman for the consideration. I'll yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Burgess. Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I do think this is an important discussion that we are having. We did not have time in subcommittee to go through this bill, nor did we get the bill in time to contact council and ask some of these questions. So, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, we're left to being able to ask questions that our constituents want to have answers to right here in committee. And I appreciate getting the time uh, to ask some of those questions. And uh, I, I am in support of Mr. Blunt's amendment. I think that it is an imperative, and it is absolutely beyond me. 
that I am hearing from some of you, we can't do anything that would stop the work we need to do on climate change. You are addressing climate change as if it is the holy grail. What we are trying to help you with is the fact that constituents and taxpayers are saying someone needs to put some roadblocks and some timelines and some check and balances into this legislation because the way it is carrying out now is there is not going to be anything to stop these rates going forward. Looking at the language that we have just looked at and that council is not able to clarify for us, whether you're looking at section 783 or whether you are over on pages 575 and 576, the American taxpayer is going to see you coming to their pocket time and time and time and time again in order to pay for this bill. This bill obviously is not about making energy more affordable and more abundant. It is about climate change and about the environment. This bill is not about having cleaner energy, more accessible and more affordable for our constituents. It is about making it harder to get and more expensive. I've got a chart that the Rural Electric Cooperative Association did. If you have not looked at this thing, you need to take a look at it. It shows you what is going to happen to rates of rural electric power users in this country once this bill is passed. Now, Mr. Blunt's amendment says, look, if it goes more than 10 percent, and with all due respect to some of my colleagues, I can tell you people do look at what happens to their rates. And they know that when that rate goes up, they've got to flip that light switch off when they leave that room. So they do pay attention to this. But it shows you that in Tennessee, the rates are expected to go up 17%. This is on this chart, and this is with the auction and $20 a ton cost of CO2. These are their estimates. In Missouri, 23%. North Dakota, 26%. Utah, 28%. So what is wrong with saying, look, this is going to be the, the little roadblock in here. This is going to be the check and balance. If it goes more than 10 percent, maybe the steps that are being taken on behalf of climate change need to be addressed and we need to look at what is going to happen for the consumers. As we have just heard in the limitations, there is not, um, if I was understanding council correctly, and I will yield back to council for them to go back and review this again. As we started on page 575 and read these limitations to you, you cannot go back, there is not a protection for the individual ratepayer in this bill. And Mr. Chairman, I think that it is going to be necessary for us to make certain that we put protections in this so that we don't see electric rates do what the president said they were going to do, which is to necessarily skyrocket. And Mr. Burgess, I will yield to you the balance of my time for further conversation with legal counsel. Well, let me just use the brief remaining time to, may I ask a question of counsel on the, the limitations paragraph that I just read? Do I, am I understanding that correctly, that no, no money will be, will be used to protect the rate payer? No, you're, that, that is not correct. Uh, the, the limitation on, uh, the, the limitation in, on page 575 says that uh, allowances distributed shall not be used to provide a rebate based solely on the quantity of electricity delivered to such rate payer. It goes on on page How Let me just, let me just ask you then, because that's just a simple question. How will it be allocated? What is, the, what is the formula that's going to be used? Where can my constituents go and, and find that information out? It goes on on page 576 to say, to the extent that the electric, electricity local distribution company uses the value of allowances to provide rebates, it shall, to the maximum extent practicable, provide such rebates with regard to the fixed portion of ratepayers' bills, 
or as a fixed credit or rebate on electricity bills. So it is entirely up to the electricity distribution company then to make that that uh, that assignment and, and assign that value. The the electricity distribution companies are all required to use allowances for the benefit of ratepayers. The electricity distribution companies are regulated by state public utility commissions which are there to protect consumers. Okay, but in a state like time. Texas, without a public utility commission, how, how, are, how are my constituents going to be protected, or how would they see that refund come to them? The, the LDC, in conjunction with the Public Utility Commission, will be required to see that the benefit goes back to the ratepayers. Time has expired. I will no, recognize that this section is not Mr. Mr. Burgess, you had five minutes, you had additional two minutes, you had additional time, and it's Mr. Scalise's turn, and I'm going to yield him full five minutes. And If he doesn't use it, he can yield it to you. But I, I think it's only fair that other members have a chance to, on your side of the aisle as well. Gentlemen, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's clear that the sections of this bill that deal with ratepayer assistance are, are very unclear, are very questionable whether or not consumers will actually see any real tangible benefit in terms of offsetting the large increases they're going to get on their utility bills. And, and I, I rise in strong support of uh, Mr. Blunt's amendment because I think this is the only real protection that we've got in place in this bill so that consumers don't get literally forced to have to shut off their utilities. Uh, during the summer in, in South Louisiana, it gets pretty hot. And if you tell some senior citizen on a fixed income uh, that once, once we get past, uh, you know, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they're going to have to shut off their air conditioning because they just can't afford to keep running the air conditioning anymore. I'll tell you what, you don't want to have to get the, the security forces out here. You're going to have to take to get all of those senior citizens and people in walkers coming up here telling you what they think about that kind of provision if you don't give them protection. And so if you look at the language in this amendment, if, if all of my friends on the other side are correct, this won't be a problem. Because we'll never get to a 10 percent increase because they're saying everybody's going to be okay. But I think what they're not telling you is everybody's not going to be okay. And you don't have to take my word or their word for it. Just take the president's word. President Obama said under his plan, under my plan, this is a quote from President Obama, under my plan of a cap and trade system, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. Skyrocket. And then you take his budget director. Mr. Orzog said, that according to his testimony, American families on average would pay about $1,300 more in utility costs per year. $1,300. And by the way, that's the low estimate. Many organizations that have done analysis of cap and trade come up with even higher numbers. But let's take the president's own budget director, the low number, $1,300 a year more families will pay in higher utility rates under this bill. Just a few weeks ago, the new CBA, CBO director, Douglas Elmendorf, testified. Mr. Chairman, the committee's not in order. The gentleman from Louisiana deserves the right to be heard. The gentleman is correct. The committee will please come to order. The gentleman may continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The new Congressional Budget Office director testified just a few weeks ago, and I quote, a cap and trade program would lead to higher prices for energy and energy intensive goods. And so with all of that, Mr. Chairman, all we have before us is an amendment that says if the rates skyrocket to the point where it's more than 10 percent over the, over the numbers it was at before, that this terminates, that we say enough is enough, because families will be saying enough is enough. Unfortunately, they don't have the protections. They didn't have all of the... Okay. Is your mic still on? Will the gentleman yield? Will the gentleman yield? Back here. How about yielding to me? I don't know who's asking you. Will the gentleman yield, Mr. Scalise? <laughs> Radonovich. Uh, I want to yield to the chairman because he might give you more time. Could we, could we suspend the <laughs> clock until we at least get our colleagues back yes, working? Yes, he has two, two minutes. We'll let him have two minutes. And, yeah, I think you've blown it up. It's, it's been capped. There is, a, there is a provision in the bill that if a mic goes out by a member, then the whole bill is not in effect <laughs> any longer. Yes, yes. Um, is there another microphone that someone would allow you to use? 
You're welcome. You, you probably kicked it loose underneath. Sometimes. If I may. Mr. Scalise, uh, you now, I will set the clock. You have two minutes. <laughs> the top row's working. <laughs> Come up, you can use mine if nobody else. Is. See, now I'm finding out just how important seniority is around this place. <laughs> Anyway, where, wherever I left off when the microphone cut out, I, I, I do think that the reason that we need this amendment is because this is the only real protection that regular American taxpayers, the ratepayers out there have. Uh, the senior citizen on a fixed income is not going to be able to understand why their rates go up 15 percent. If their utility rates necessarily skyrocket, they don't have the luxury of saying, well, I'll just pay another $130 this month because my average utility rate is going to go up $1,300 a year. They don't have that luxury. And so then they're going to be forced, like with what we've dealt with with health care. The reason we need health care reform, there are a lot of reasons, but one reason is you've got senior citizens out there that literally have to make the choice between getting their prescription medication or running their air condition during the summer or their heating bill, uh, heat, heat during, the, during the winter. And so you're going to give them one more tough choice like that where they can't afford these higher utility rates. And so what they're going to have to do is sit down and make a decision. Do I actually run the air condition in the summer when it's 110 degrees with humidity? Or do I just turn it off because of this cap and trade energy tax that somebody thought was a great idea? And I'll just have to do without something else that I can't do without. We need to give them this protection. That's what this amendment is for. So I would urge support and I, and I would uh, yield the balance my time to Mr. Vodanovich. Thank you, uh, Mr. Scalise. I do want to, it's really important to say that, that the rates, we're talking about the, the rates to payers. We're talking about their electric bill, their natural, their gas bill, but the, and the gentleman from Pennsylvania mentioned about how they'd be protected if that's the case. But this, it's way beyond that because the increase of gas and natural gas is going to have a huge impact on the price of food, the price of clothing, the, cr the price of toys, the cost of construction of homes, the price for school books. None of this takes into account what we're talking about here. It's all over and above protecting the ratepayer from electricity and their, their, their electric and their uh, natural, uh, their, their utility bills. And so we're not even making a dent in what the, the impact is going to be on the households. I would think this is the least we could do is to make sure that their rates don't go uh, higher than what the Blunt Amendment allows. But keep in mind that the impact to the consumer is going to go far beyond their utility bills. It's going to increase in cost to them in every manner in which they live in that household that the energy is delivered to. So I appreciate that time and yield back. The time has expired. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll, Mr. Chairman, move to strike the last word. The gentleman has spoken on this issue, I believe. Have you? No, I have not. You have not spoken not on this Not on this issue. one. I think I have on the others, but. <laughs> okay. I, I, well, we're going to recognize a Democrat first then. And then we'll come to you, and I, That's hope, fair. And I hope it will conclude the uh, debate. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, can I have a point of personal privilege for about 30 seconds? Yes, gentlemen. Uh, the chairman has been very generous in offering to provide food for both sides, and, and I'm very supportive of that. We found out that the food that we were provided are cucumber sandwiches. <laughs> now, I know we're politically correct, Mr. Chairman, but I'm going to order Popeye's chicken for both sides. And, and if there's some undecided Democrats, I hope you keep that in mind. <laughs> you know, if uh, the gen gentleman is very, very generous, and uh, we did, uh, we did provide uh, sandwiches for both sides. And I know we have sandwiches other than cucumber sandwiches. Although I know you like to be healthy on your side of the aisle, but we'll make sure that you have the same thing we have, and. Um, uh, and, and, and members, I, I hope, will find something that will suit their appetites. I understand that, that Mr. Barton, not realizing we were going to provide food for both sides, has, has already purchased dinner for his side. Uh, so you do have choices over there. And I'm going to purchase dinner tomorrow night for both sides. Uh, well, we accept that. And it will not be cucumber and, and And that we may then provide uh, the breakfast for um, <laughs> Wednesday morning. Sounds like a <laughs> Midnight snack.
Uh, members who wish to uh, partake of food, uh, get there before the staffs do, because there won't be anything left if they get it first. Okay, the chair wishes to recognize himself. And I will uh, do it in three minutes, I'll yield myself three minutes. The bill that's before us provides for an allocation of permits to the utilities for the purpose of holding the ratepayers, protecting the ratepayers from increases in costs for their electric utilities. And we think we have protected the ratepayers in that way. But if we adopt this amendment that's before us, it provides that if the rates for utilities go up 10 percent in any year, the whole bill is no longer in effect. Now, can you imagine a business person in this country who's going to rely on the terms of this legislation for investment? They want to know what the rules are going to be. And the rules say to them, we want more investment in renewables. We want more investment in clean energy. We want people to go out and be entrepreneurs and figure out ways to hold down the costs overall and still achieve the, envir the, envir the limits on the carbon emissions. We want to become more self-sufficient in an energy. We want to transform our economy with more jobs. You can't do that from year to year where the law will either be in effect or not in effect. We already had a proposal that uh, if uh, China and India didn't go, uh, adopt this, the same re stringent requirements, poof, the law is no longer in effect. We have a similar amendment here. If electricity rates go up 10 percent, no longer in effect. That is not the way to make sound policy, in my view. We have disagreements, but it's not, in my view, not a way to make sound policy. You cannot set in, in motion a plan to make us more independent, to bring about greater jobs, to work on new, uh, new ways to hold down costs and uh, produce it, the results we want by having it in effect one year and not in effect another year. So I would urge, uh, without even taking up the full three minutes I allotted to myself, that this amendment be rejected. And I now want to recognize the gentleman from Oregon, and I will recognize him for five minutes or three minutes. Which does he want? Well, I'll make you a deal. You recognize me for five, and I'll go for three. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes to use the I think that is my, and we my right under the rules. All. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I think you make a, a very valid point. I actually was in small business for 21 years and eight months in the radio business. As you know, we paid fairly substantial electricity rates to run the transmitters. The way I read the limitation may be a little different than some of my colleagues. Limitation on page 575, sub C, limitation, says an electricity local distri distribution company shall not use the value of emission allowances distributed under this subsection to provide to any rate payer a rebate that's based solely on the quantity of electricity delivered to such rate payer. So that's a disconnect from the amount of electricity you use from the rebate. It's decoupling, correct? I'd ask counsel. That's, that's the common term, decoupling, correct? That, that's, that's not the definition of decoupling. What the bill says is that the, the, the value provided to the rate payer uh, shall not be based solely on the quantity of, of the electricity. electricity delivered to right. the rate payer. So you're disconnecting. Well, I'll, I'll make the case and, and I won't ask you the question. How's that? The bottom line is you are disconnecting from the rebate from the amount of electricity consumed. Correct. It cannot be, a rebate cannot be based solely on that. And so then what it does, it says to the extent an electricity local distribution company uses the value of emissions allowances distributed under this subsection to provide rebates, it shall to the maximum extent practicable provide such rebates with regard to the fixed portion of the ratepayers' bills or as a fixed credit or rebate on electricity bills. So in other words, we are disconnecting from the amount of electricity you consume when it comes to this rebate and saying we're going to to the, to the maximum extent possible, just put a flat rebate back, regardless of the amount of electricity consumed. You cannot use as the sole discretion the amount of electricity consumed. That's correct. To the, to the extent the allowances are used for rebates, that is correct. That is correct. And so, in my opinion, you are, ha you are now creating a, a much different cost basis out there. If you are a small business and you are in a, a rate 
situation where the distribution company is going to issue rebates, it is going to come back on a flat rate, not based on the amount of electricity I use. They cannot use electricity as the sole determinant. It cannot be the sole amount of electricity cannot be. And in fact, the la language goes on to say that uh, it shall, to the maximum extent practical, provide such rebates with regard to the fixed portion of the ratepayers' bills. It says that. Yes, correct. So the the statute here is encouraging that, saying to the maximum extent practicable, you're going to give a flat rebate back. And so, from my perspective, this is a small business job killer provision that doesn't treat small business fairly, because it says you're just going to get a we're going to spread this out evenly over everybody, regardless how much electricity you use. And if you're in business and you're producing widgets or, or radio waves, you're going to use more electricity than if you're sitting at home. And I believe this is going to drive up energy costs disproportionately on small businesses, and it will hurt rural communities and jobs. I yield back. If, if the council would still yeah. have an opportunity to respond. Yes. Under, under paragraph B, this is on page 575, it is uh, the LDC is required to distribute the benefits among ratepayer classes rateably. So a, a, a small business uh, is unlikely to be in the same ratepayer class as a homeowner. Now, how do, is that true across the board? It, it will be. It will in be every state. The, the way that the PUCs and the the LDCs have set up the the, the way the PUCs have set up the rate structure. Because I I just paid. I don't think I was treated any differently as a small business than I was at a home. I paid Pacific Core. A monthly bill based on my kilowatt hour usage. It, it would depend on the rate structure that the PUCs have set up in the, the various states. Right. And and so the statement you just made may vary state to state. Then it, it it's up to the individual state PUCs the the way they've set it up to protect uh, consumers within the their states. All right. So I don't know that we have a clear answer. Then it's going to yeah, yeah. I'd yield to the ranking member. I just want to ask. These allowances that the LDCs get, in and of themselves, they have no value. They have to sell them to get value, to give a rebate. They, they could be one way to I mean, get they value have would to be, be to sell them. They, yeah. they could also uh, provide them to an electricity generator as partial payment for electricity. But if you are going to give a rebate to the consumer, you have to monetize that allowance or you can't give a rebate. Isn't that correct? I, I, I believe that's correct. So they sell the allowances. And that, whoever that, they sell an them option. to, that's a cost increase. Whoever they sell them to has to pass that cost increase on in some way. Isn't that correct? The, the, Unless they sell yes, them to the they, federal government, they would not government. necessarily pass it through to the consumer, but they would they would pass through a cost if they buy the allowance, if they're if they're able to do so. Gentlemen's time has expired. We'd like to now proceed to a vote on the Blunt Amendment. All those in favor of the Blunt Amendment, say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. Mr. Chairman, we have a Let's go to a roll call vote. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher, no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak. No. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. No. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green. Ms. DeGette. No. Ms. DeGette, no. Mrs. Capps. Mrs. Capps, no. Mr. Doyle. No. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. No. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Chikowski. Mr. Gonzalez. No. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee. No. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. No. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. No. Mr. Weiner, no. 
Mr. Matheson. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson. No. Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Barrow. No. Mr. Barrow, no. Mr. Hill. No. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui. No. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. No. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. No. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. No. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut, no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Mr. Sutton. I'm sorry, Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Aye. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mr. Blunt votes aye. Mr. Boyer. Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Aye. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Mr. Walden. Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Ms. Blackburn. Aye. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. Ms. Schakowsky. No. Ms. Schakowsky votes no. Mr. Green. No. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Matheson. No. Mr. Matheson votes no. Mr. Rush. No. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes no. Have all members responded to the uh, rule? Any member wish to change his or her vote? If not, the uh, clerk will tally the vote. Yes, clerk will announce the vote. Uh, Mr. Chairman, on that vote, the yeas were 23, the nays were 30, 20, 32. 23 ayes, 32 noes. The amendment's not agreed to. I want to ne re next uh, call on uh, Ms. Baldwin, but I do want to make an announcement. Uh, we did provide food. We are going to continue to go through the markup. Members and staff may avail themselves of the food. And I do want to announce that we didn't just give the Republicans cucumbers, we gave them bologna <laughs> and salami and some ham. It really is. It really is all vegetarian. Well, that'll be corrected. Um, <laughs> Ms. Baldwin, uh, you seek recognition for the purpose of offering an amendment, is that correct? You've been watching day two of a markup of a climate change bill. Live coverage of this meeting of the House Energy and Commerce Committee will continue now on our companion network, C-SPAN. Yes, it has, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General
Over the next hour here on C-SPAN 3, highlights of today's coverage, including President Obama's new rules for auto emissions and fuel efficiency. 